Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome here to HIPA workshop. This workshop will be very special because it's two days uh, workshop, and it is finally talking about videography. Uh, a lot of people were asking us actually to offer uh, more about videography, and here we are. Uh, this lecture, uh, this workshop is sponsored by uh, Nikon, and we have the Nikon representative, uh, Mr. Tariq Abdurrahman. Mr. Tariq Abdurrahman, he will uh, be the first lecturer today, and uh, we will have in total four lectures over the two days or two uh, days workshop. A little bit orientation today, we will have four hours um, uh, lecture. And we will have about uh, 30 minutes uh, break in between for sunset prayer. For the gents, if you wish to pray, please go to the ground floor. Uh, there is a special prayer room. And for, for the ladies, there is a room exactly next to the reception. You can pray there. Uh, don't forget that this uh, two days workshops are live streamed on YouTube. If you think that some of your friends or families couldn't make it to come today, please send them the link. And it will stay there, there forever. If you wish to revise your information or something, you will find it always there. Uh, we will not have certificates today. The certificates will be distributed tomorrow. Welcome and enjoy the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ola. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is uh, Tariq Abdurrahman. I'm general manager of customer satisfaction Nikon Middle East. And I'm part of this training uh, today and tomorrow, uh, most importantly, to cover the camera operation naturally from uh, brand of Nikon. Uh, however, uh, I'm going really to focus on the camera operation and the definitions and basics of video. So uh, I'll have to try to manage well my time because we are four speakers, uh, two today and two tomorrow. So uh, probably we need to well organize our timing from our side so that we can have the best and uh, most accurate uh, deliverable of information across the two days. And um, today also, Eddie will follow me. Uh, and he's going to talk about advanced, media, advanced video. Um, Joe, tomorrow, he will open the training with Adobe Premiere Pro related to video applications and editing, followed by Ra Sharma. He is uh, ambassador of Xeon. And actually, he's not going to talk solely about Xeon. He's going to talk about a complete demonstration of video application, including audio, lighting, and all together uh, focus mastering. So his is going to be uh, probably a summary, an advanced summary of everything all together. So yeah, please uh, don't miss any of them. You could have missed mine, but uh, don't miss any of the other three. They are really important and good. Uh, well, what are we going to talk about is just uh, as, I, as I mentioned. So specifically, what I'm going to start with right now is the camera operation technologies, video basic terminologies, I'm sorry, and editing preparations. Uh, so that's probably what I'm going to talk about. But uh, you know, all these topics are going to be um, uh, cross-related. So. I can't separate them. They're going to be uh, all together while going. Well, today, who can benefit from, from this training? Um, obviously, and it is designed primarily for existing photographers who are willing to be videographers also, to explore videography and, and, and change or be additional to the photography career, videography careers as well. And um, how many photographers are here? Just say probably everybody registering in HIPAA is a photographer, that's by logic. But uh, yeah, so uh, the the basic knowledge of uh, photography is uh, probably uh, 
good to have in, in that training. So we're going to assume that you know some background uh, in some of the terminologies and function of the camera and lighting and so on, which is uh, just based uh, principally on uh, photographers. Uh, however, that's not only uh, uh, photographers, even beginners in video uh, could benefit that training by gaining more information. A beginner, a beginner in video could be a vlogger, so he could be finding some advantage to learn some uh, more topics and uh, expand his system probably. Uh, also a person who, who've never been photographer or videographer but is uh, willing and he's so uh, uh, you know, uh, enthusiastic to, to join or to be a videographer. But uh, the, the will to be a videographer I think is a must because videography is a little bit uh, more sophisticated topic compared to photography. So, um, why video? Why do we talk about video? I think it's uh, undeniable that last two or three years we've seen a huge migration of photographers to videography and uh, a lot, plenty of applications has been uh, also in, in videography. Now, if you would chance to see the Deloitte Insights report of 2019, which states plenty of statistics, all of them supporting strongly that video is going to be the media of communication rather than photography. So going back, we know that medium of communication was typing, hello, how are you, sending emails, sending messages, writing letters, whichever. So it was writing and reading which has moved significantly in the early 2000s to photography. And the image became the, the way and the method of communication uh, between, between people, uh, which has been helped uh, and assisted significantly by social media. But uh, lately, last five years, we've seen that video started to replace photography in that sense. And video is a better communication because it expresses a movement, a change of situation, which is better for the human mind to understand. Uh, so that all helped in the prevalence of videography. Um, and definitely, definitely the most important factor of that is the 5G, which is going to render sharing videos across internet uh, never like before. So it's going to be a complete revolutionary. and. Um, Day by day, the networks of optical fiber are growing on the planet, allowing for much, much more and uh, much, much more bandwidths, allowing for uh, easier share of uh, video. So, uh, yeah, video is, is easy to digest, it's easy to show and tell, it explains better, it markets better, it, it, everything is moving to video right now. So, um, it's undeniably a very important platform of work right now. And because of that, and added to that, it's also a lot of money there. And that's probably what is really making people moving to videography. So if you just check, I'm sorry to say it, but if you just check a wedding, covering a wedding as a photog the photography or, or as a videography, probably videographer is paid thrice or four times more than a photographer. So yes, it is um, an area whereby money can be made easier and a lot of variety of ways of creating money as well. So that's the background of why we're talking about video and why video is becoming important, why brands like Nikon uh, just came very, um, how to say, very uh, strongly in, in, the, in the video application and came with few models which have gained uh, quite, uh, quite good acceptance. But let's go just a little bit, a little bit into history. And the reason why I'm going back to history is just to help understanding some of the definitions and terminologies that are used today. So I'm not just going back to, to give some uh, history for, um, you know, without, without any purpose. And, um, and also uh, by saying that, I. I have no intention whatsoever to, to really make it technical. 
but videography, sometimes you need to know what is behind those terminologies a little bit. Otherwise, just knowing the, the term doesn't really help much. So you need to know a little bit of the background of that term uh, so that you can utilize it properly for your uh, favor. Uh, well, video started by such TV 50s or more years back. And we, there were antennas like that which which used to uh, broadcast, it was called the broadcast. So all the signal uh, of, of video, or we say TV, were broadcasted through antennas like that. And there were in each country, in each zone, geographic zone, some distribution of these type of antennas. And video was distributed as such, so just there in the air. Okay. Um, so the only way to send channels at that time is a frequency separation. So each channel has a frequency slot. And because more channels wanted to, to be there and to broadcast, so they tried to narrow down the frequency bands. You know? they, can't, they can't keep accommodating everybody. It's just one air. It's, it's just here. So we have no other medium of, trans of communication. It's not like today we have optical fiber. We can lie down another cable. That's no problem. But at that time, that was not pos possible. Technology wouldn't allow it. So it was only the frequency bands were to separate that. And because of this, the engineers were working on, you know, but if we go below the 5 megahertz for each channel, it won't be looking good. So we have to look on some solution or the other. And at that time, what they came up with is uh, a format of broadcast called interlace, which uh, eventually, because of the technologies that I just mentioned, started to vanish. And it's no more required. As I'm saying, we have the satellite communications, we have the optical fibers, which are just much, much more enough than using just the, the uh, terrestrial broadcast, which was used at that time. However, still some systems are using interlace. So uh, the reason why I'm there, just saying it is that if you see interlace, the letter I stands for interlace. And what does that mean is that for each image, okay, you have only half of the line. So it, it just scans one line, skips a second, gets a third, and skips a fourth, and so on. And the next image, it just does the reverse. You know. So for the human eye was naturally accumulating those that light and doesn't seem to be too odd for the human eye. The, you know, human lived with that system for more than 60 or 70 years. So probably was good enough as a solution. And it just really shrunk down the bandwidth to half. So it was a good solution. But uh, as I said, starting from 15 years back was no, no more needed and we could display all the lines, which is a natural, the normal thing, you know. Any, any image, you need all the lines. That's, that's a natural thing, which is called progressive P. So in the formats, in the video formats, you would see P and I, uh, which is uh, differentiating between interlace and progressive. Whenever you see that, you can understand what's the background for it. I, you don't need to use it unless you have some compatibilities that you're caring for then you use interlace. Otherwise, you just use progressive because that's what the technology can afford for you, and that gives you much better quality. Moving forward, we'll have to talk about video formats. In photography, you just take an image. If you have 47 megapixel, then that will eventually bring you a picture proportional with, with, with an amount of data proportional to the 47 megapixel. Well, just you have it on your laptop, then you can crop it and have another number of pixels. When it comes to video, we can't really do that. We are framed, we are confined within some uh, video formats, specific video formats. And these video formats are predefined. For example, you probably have heard about full high definition, uh, which is pretty much available in the current channels nowadays. And uh, before that, uh, we had for a long time the standard definition, which nowadays I don't think it's much of existence. But um, we have full high definition as one of the very prevailing formats. Probably in your home, uh, your receivers, uh, 
uh, have the majority, if not all the channels, as full high definition. The full high definition is how to just explain it just briefly. That means that it has 1920 pixel in the horizontal direction and 1080 in the vertical direction. So these are the components of the image. And each pixel is a part of this image. If we're talking about 4K, so it doubles the number of pixel, pixels in the horizontal direction and it doubles it in the vertical direction, which means the number of pixels ending up to be twice. Is it twice? Do you agree? Four times. It is four times, okay? Twice vertically, twice horizontally, so we have four times the amount of data in 4K, okay? So 4K is a format, and full HD is another format, actually. Those are the two dominant formats in recording right now. So how do we start video, you know, just to easily understand, if we have an image, it just gets, it has to be first, um, you know, sampled, to take a sample out of it. Sampling is just done automatically by having your sensor divided into small windows like that. So each window is a pixel. A pixel is a small window, which defines the smallest possible information that can be captured from the image, from your image. And um, the same, actually, whatever we have just said till now is applicable for photography as well. So it's equally the same in photography, except that in video, you, you just have uh, a certain number of, uh, of pixels horizontally and vertically. That is your component of your video. So your image first, as a first step, needs to be um, uh, sampled. And sample means just converting an image from that shape to that shape, okay? So it is sampled. You have this and this and this and this. Here, you cannot say wh where, what is the components of this image, okay? So here you sample it, okay? So uh, that is the first part of, of the information cutting out. And the second part is quantizing it. So each of these samples will have some level, okay? And that number of levels is called the quantization bits. So you can, sometimes you hear that this video system or this camera is capable of uh, processing and communicating eight bits or 10 bits. Have you heard that? That's eight bit format or 10 bit. Actually, even in photography, it's the same, right? 8-bit, 10-bit, 12-bit, 14-bit, isn't it? Have you? Each sample, each sample taken, okay, is divided into quantization levels. Fine? That's essential. That's very important for video. And because of that, for example, we have that monitor here. That's a special broadcast monitor. It's capable of receiving 16-bit, okay? And uh, th that's really important to gain dynamic range, extremely important, okay? If you have a very good lens, very good sensor, very good electronics, and you have eight bits, then no matter what you do, you are limited to 256 levels. So your dynamic range is just good, okay? But if you have 10 bits, then you have more than a thousand level, which enriches your image much more. And that's, that's a difference between um, an 8-bit and a 10-bit, let's say. You know, you see, the, the less number of levels will, will create that type of image compared to a 10-bit, because 10-bit has much more levels of a signal. Okay? And it reflects also in a number of, of colors. So in case of 8 bits, we have 16.7 million colors. In case of 10 bits, we have 1.07 billion colors. So the number of, colors, number of colors is much more as well. Okay. And color sampling also is a part of, of, of that sampling. Um, well, I'll go through this a little bit uh, uh, quicker. Uh, if you have a color sampling equal to the black and white, like here, uh, that is a system which is too sophisticated, practically not existing. 
And the system that we have in such a camera right now, the output we can have is 422, which means the colors are sampled half of. And 411 is an internal recording inside the camera or the more uh, consumer-based cameras. So let's start to define a frame rate because in video we don't have just image. These images are coming in sequence. And we have three frame rates which are dominant, 24 frames, 25 frames, and 30 frames per second, okay? Which you can uh, see them in, in the camera menu, okay? Um, so uh, that is a full, full high definition progressive format. Um, that's showing the difference between the full high definition and high definition format, 720p, and the PAL standard system. So the more pixels gives you a richer image and video as well. Okay. Well, I'll jump over this and I would like here to define the bit rate. So as much as data is produced, uh, in case of photography, you're, taking, you're clicking for an image and you're storing that image in your memory and that's it. So you're storing your, uh, an amount of data in your memory and you do not really worry much about the time. Uh, in case of video, you, don't ha you can't really uh, leave it open like that because you're talking about a sequence of coming uh, pictures. So uh, you need to make sure that you have a flow of data and that which is fast enough, fast enough to take all your data from your camera to your memory card or from the camera to another device, which is called your bitrate. The so bitrate is one of the very known terminologies uh, in video, which defines how fast is the communication and whether that communication is capable of transferring uh, high quality video or not. It's a certainly very important factor. It applies to everything, camera to recorder or inside the camera itself or through the internet, what is your bitrate will define how far you can uh, send, transfer or receive data video. Uh, quality video. So going into camera menu, which is any camera will have the same, uh, you, you get to select your formats. So from the frame size, frame rate, okay, you can start to select which format you're looking for. And all what I've been explaining till now is just to be able to realize what does this mean at the end of the day. So if you're choosing your format, you need definitely to know <coughs> what exactly you're doing, right? So, and you need to, to be capable of knowing what is that format and what are you going to, to do with it. So um, the selection of, of your video format in that sense uh, starts with the first number, which is a uh, horizontal resolution, 3840, and the vertical resolution, 2120, uh, which is a 4K. Okay, that defines eventually a 4K. Okay? And inside the 4K, you have three selections. 30 frames, 25 frames, and 24 frames per second. All of them, P means progressive. As you can see here in this menu, we have probably everything P progressive. As I said, because nowadays you, you, you don't need for an internal recording and interlace. You don't need that anymore. Okay, that's all technology. Here you don't need it. So all is P. However, since it, it is a part of the, the video terminology, it's still stated, you know. So uh, you have all progressive, and you have 30 frames, 25 frames, 24 frames per second. So the frame rate is, somebody can tell me what's the frame rate? Again, based on what I said. Anybody? Number of pictures per second, absolutely. So we have 30, 25, or 24 with the same resolution. 
with the same format, with the same number of pixels. Okay? Why? Because if all of them are good for, for, for us for visually seeing a video, so why do we have a variety of them? Um, 24 frames per second is the cinema. So going to old days, visiting a cinema, uh, you, you had the machines rolling and showing films in, in, in sequence. So how many, how many film picture was shown per second? 24 frames per second. So I think all manufacturers, I guess all of them, are equipping the camera with a similar frame rate, 24 frames per second, so that if you want to convert this to match a cinema, then you can record it on 24 frames per second straight away and utilize it later on for the cinema application. Okay, so 24 frames per second, cinema. 25 frames and 30 frames per second. Does anybody know what is this? Well, going back to the old days, as I explained, there were two systems of broadcast, PAL and NTSC. And um, the engineers at that time, when they developed the broadcast format, they thought of the best thing to relate the number of image or frames per second is to relate it to the power generation frequency, right? So you, you know that that light that we are using right now Okay, or the power which, which is used for the projector or the screens or whatever we are using over here is by an alternative current, isn't it? You know that, right? You slept already? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> you don't know, okay. <laughs> the power received, the power generated and received here whereby we can utilize it for all of this is an alternative current. It just doesn't come straight, same value. It keeps up and down, okay? Up and down very fast, very quickly. And well, we are here in Dubai, so we have the power reaching here is 50 times a second, 50 hertz, okay? So our power is 50 hertz. If you plug anything in, in a wall, you have a 50 hertz power, okay? So at that time, the engineer said, well, you know, beca because the cameras were not, were not like that. The camera was the size of that podium, actually. So, and, and it was it was rolling. If you know, if you have heard in, in probably in some of the Western movies, when I say rolling, so rolling means it, it's really something that rolls, you know. So it was a cinema at that time. So it was a machine, and that machine is powered at the end of the day. So it has to be powered with an alternative current. So the best thing at that time to do was to synchronize between the frequency and the number of image per second. So if we have 50 hertz power, then the AC motor at the time was better to generate 25 image per second, okay? But that applies in Europe, in the Middle East, Africa, and many of Asian countries, except Japan, Philippines, and Korea. So what are these countries using together with the US and Canada? They are using another frequency. There, in, their, in these countries, they are using uh, power alternating 60 times a second, 60 hertz, okay? So they're the same concept. They use 30 frames per second, okay? So that is the origin of having a split of two frames per second nowadays. But you know what? Something very important that such a projector or TV or display or your smartphone or PC or whichever will be capable to automatically select 25 or 30 and just place um, whichever is there. So why do we have to bother about selecting one of them? Um, could be any. Actually not. Um, and we have to select the frequency or the frame rate according to the frequency of power that we have in our country. Okay, I'll just go through that uh, just a little later. What I have to say here is that um, we have also 120 and 100 frames per second, 60 frames and 50 frames per second. Each one has is a multiple of the 30. So 120 is 
uh, 4 times 30, and 60 is 2 times 30. Uh, 100 is twice 25, and, and uh, sorry, 4 times of 25, and 50 is twice of 25. So these are more number of frames per second. So what for it could be used? For the slow motion. More frames per second, then you take it on your software and stretch it out. Because the human eye, good enough for it is 25 frames per second. So we, we don't need to have 50 frames per second. It won't, won't help in anything, actually, uh, if you are going to play it back with the same speed. So 50 hertz or 100 hertz are ultimately used for slow motion. Okay? But when you record it as 120 frames per second or 60 frames per second, please note that the slow motion is going to happen only when you put it on your PC, on your station, and stretch it and get slow motion out of it. Okay, otherwise, uh, it's just going to be played normally and, and won't have any difference. Okay, but uh, this camera, the Z6 and Z7 and Z50, are also equipped with a direct slow motion. So what the camera is going to do here is going to take that number of frames per second and do it for you and do it, just give you the slow motion. That's it. You can take it straight away, use slow motion, okay? So you can record it in this format, but please note you do not have, definitely don't have any audio related to it. It's just the slow motion, but keeping the ultimate quality as it is so you don't lose any quality in such three formats. Again, please note the NTSC related and parallel and cinema related formats when, when you select any of them. Okay, why? Do we have to select a frame rate which is exactly as our power? Because frames means that your sensor opens, captures one of the frames, closes again, and, and, and keep doing that uh, over and over again. Uh, let's say it does that 30 times a second, means 30 frames per second. And your power is 60 frames. Uh, just for sake of illustration, I'm just showing it like that, but let's say uh, 60, 60 hertz uh, indoor lighting. So if you have that situation, you don't have a problem in the indoor illumination when you are shooting indoors. If you, if you are shooting in a NTSC country, related country, so your frames are going to be synchronized and won't ever get affected. But in case you change your frame rate to 25, then you end up after some time that one of your frames is going to be completely dark because your camera is going to open at the time when the electricity is not there. All of that, we're talking about 60 times a second, or we can't see it with our visual eyes, okay? So what does end up with? It just, you see flickering in your video. Your video flickers, okay? So that is the result of it. So why do we have to select the right format? To avoid flickering okay if you are pro flicker just ruin your video straight away okay you can't share it you can't sell it you can't do anything with it you have a possibility to correct it to some extent uh, you can't correct it completely okay so please note that's extremely important I've seen people living with a camera for for time for months and then they say but just, I don't know why it flickers and then it just ends up that they are not selecting the right format Okay, so please note that it's, it's really important. So simple, but important, okay? And I just can do it very easily through the camera. And yeah, if you were forced at the moment to, to, to shoot in a format and you want to convert it to another, then you can have a flicker reduction on uh, if you're forced for this situation. But uh, I highly recommend to select straight away the right format uh, proportional to your indoor lighting, okay? And th does that selection matter if you are doing an outdoor shooting? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Absolutely. Does the sun have any frequency? The sun is just, you know, pumping light all across. It's DC is constant. It does not change. So you don't worry if it is an external shoot. But, yeah, definitely, if you are going to have some, um, you know, uh, some shooting in indoor and outdoor, then probably you need to have uh, the harmony between all shootings. 
okay so now having your video rec you know captured by the camera and processed uh, there is another step which has to be certainly done before recording on the uh, memory card which is a compression so compression takes the data captured by the sensor and just compress it okay it compresses the video and there are probably more than one type of compression and each type has a different level of uh, data loss and quality maintenance as well okay and um, the compression doesn't happen in each frame independently uh, in when it is recorded in the memory card but it does do the compression does the compression across a sequence of frames okay which are called group of pictures GOP okay so compression is uh, is again another important factor that you don't need to get deep into it actually although it's by itself a science compression is by itself a science really uh, but uh, you, you don't need to get deep into it just you need to know um, what is it in general you need to know that there is a compression happening at, and the video that you are recording on your memory card on your on your uh, uh, SD card is not uh, just what the camera receives it, it does some compression and uh, you, you uh, often have to you know select to what level of compression you want and there are two types of compression intra frame compression which is um, less compressed but gives more quality and in that case the camera or your computer does the same as well does does have a compression engine it compresses each frame separately but interframe compression as I said in the previous slide it does a compression considering a group of images a group of photos obviously interframe compression is stronger we remove much more data and uh, will be more efficient however it will remove the identity of each individual frame which could be uh, later on a little bit of difficulty in the post processing or in editing okay so um, these are the diff two types of of uh, compression in relation to the frames so uh, not getting too deep into this but there is lossless ways to do compression and there are other ways whereby you lose data while you do com doing compression but of course engineers have set methods and algorithms which uh, really get rid of data as much as possible but without trying to touch significantly the quality of your video uh, and many techniques are there which spatial redundancy removes uh, removes whatever is not required of the data of in simple way if you have if, if I'm if I'm filming um, that part for example here which is the same color and the same intensity so it does not have to keep each pixel and record it as one pixel it just says you know what we have here all that is this value that's all so that's one of the ways of compression for example you know so um, many ways of compression are there which are not affecting the quality just other ways of saving the data in a more efficient and without losing the quality okay um, so yeah the lossless we have run lens coding Huffman coding Shannon arithmetic dictionary based so all of these are uh, different types of lossless compression and a frame actually is divided into squares where uh, the amount of data is different that's why the, the processor is going to deal with each square or which is block said to be uh, differently okay that's an example of also the delta frames so the key frame is taken completely and subsequent frames are taken only parts of it so that it minimizes the amount of data taken in each step and that is a compression that exactly is a compression okay using delta frames so these are done by engines there is an engine inside the camera which is a hardware there is another a similar engine on your PC or your smartphone which is a software engine being hardware or software they do the same and they are exactly the same basis and the same um, um, algorithm and in this case in our camera we have the H264 which is the engine compressing and decompressing 
uh, the video that we have. You need to know it, and you need to know what it does in general. You don't need to get deep into it, but that's what it does, and it's H264, a deriv derivative of the MPEG-4. Okay? So that's what it does, our compression on our camera, uh, when you're recording on your memory card. And that's exactly what a codec is. So that was a codec. H264 is a codec. There are plenty of codecs. H.264, one of the most used for camera applications. Um, well, that exactly resumes what I've just mentioned, lossless and lossy codecs. So we don't need to go through all of this. But uh, sometimes you, you would see also another terminology beside codec, which stands, as I said, for coding and decoding. You find a container, and container is different. It does not do compression and decompression. It just formulates your video file, how it does it look like. So different containers could have the same H.264, okay? Um, so that's how you're saving your format, okay? Those are just terminologies that you need to probably know about it. And yes, how do we see compression in our menu is over here, movie quality. So movie quality, is uh, uniquely defined, is uni uniquely indicating the amount of quality that we, uh, that we can record, and eventually the compression as well. And we have selected here, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, full, full high definition, 1080, which is full high definition, 25 frames per second, and that allows us to go to the movie quality and select either high quality or normal quality high quality or normal quality, is the amount of compression that the camera is going to impose on the received video, okay? So high quality is a higher quality, but bigger size. I mean, that is nothing for free, obviously. So a bigger size, bigger amount of data, and uh, longer time of transmission if you are uh, uploading it, right? Um, normal is little less, little less of quality, uh, but um, smaller size, more efficient, in uh, uploading and downloading. So it's, you know, it's a compromise that you have to decide according to where are you going to utilize this video and your video content as well. And that's what could be the purpose or the benefit of understanding what is the compression itself. Because let's say, let's say you're filming me right now while I'm doing this session. You probably don't need to have a high quality because there is no much movement in what I'm doing. And that can make the codec, your engine, easy to compress the video. It's different than if you are uh, filming your kids running around or some sport or some match or some sport happening or a wildlife. All of these have a lot of frame moving and changing fast and you need uh, you know, uh, a strong encoder. So, um, so you select the compression according to, according to the, the content also that you are shooting. Uh, please note here that if I go and select, let's say, a full high definition, still 25 frames per second, then the quality selection is going to be deactivated. It's not anymore possible to select your quality because you, with that selection, you are just reaching to the maximum capacity of your processor handling. So you can't anymore go beyond that. So you don't have this selection. The same applies if you select, let's say, 100 frames per second, even still with a high definition, because you have four times the amount of data, still your quality is deactivated uh, equally. Only if you go to 50 frames per second, then you can come to select your quality. So it depends on the capacity of your processor and to what extent it allows you to do uh, more uh, processes um, in relation to your video encoding and decoding. Okay, so we have two types, and that's containers that I, I've mentioned about. That's a, that is a container. So actually, both of them are using H.264 as an engine, compression, compressing, video compressing engine. Both of them are using the same, but .mov and .mp4 just are different in the audio file. The audio file in .mov is uncompressed, which is PCM, pulse code modulation, 
uncompressed audio, but digital, of course. And MP4 is a compressed audio. That's the difference between uh, those two formats. Well, cropping. We know cropping from photography, right? You can crop on a camera. You can crop using your, your camera. You can, select, you can select the cropping. Or you can crop on your PC straight right away. You, either way, you can just do a cropping. In photography, yes, you're doing a crop, a crop, and you're changing your perspective, definitely. At each time you're cropping, it looks like you're zooming in other way, you know? Uh, and it, what does it affect in this case? What's, what could the it be? The quality and the pixels, exactly. That's what it affects on the picture. The, the photography, the photograph or the image keep losing pixels, you know? But when it comes to video, the camera will allow you to crop. Of course, you can crop equally on a post-production. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But the camera allows you to do a cropping. But when the camera allows you to do cropping, you need to remember that you have selected the format. And the camera will be bound to that format anyways. OK? So whether you select here or you select here, it will be a full HD, which means the same number of horizontal and vertical pixels. The camera will certify and guarantee to maintain that, no matter what cropping you have selected. You are finally confined with the format that you have selected in terms of number of horizontal and vertical pictures, uh, pixels and the number of frames per second. Okay? So that is the difference of cropping in photography and videography. Okay? So yeah, in a camera, you can select in your cropping, choose the image area. In Nikon, it's called image area, and you can select FX or DX. Well, just as I said, we're talking here today, probably you ladies, gentlemen, mostly photographer based. And um, just quick comparison so that it, it just gets us to match what you're talking about uh, gradually uh, between what is in photography and what is in videography. So um, shutter speed, which is known in photography, is equivalent to shutter angle in most probably cinematography, but sometimes in videography as well. And nowadays, it's just also becoming, to be frank, shutter speed as well in, in, in videography. But aperture and f-stop is really very recognized in video as iris. and T stop instead of F stop. Okay, T stands for transport stop. So aperture is iris. If you hear, if you listen, iris is exactly the same, but they use iris. And the same for ISO sensitivity, and that applies still today. They do video guys do not say ISO; they say gain, the video gain. Okay, and they have a switch straight away on outside of the camera where it can really control the video gain of the camera for the most ad more advanced type of cameras. Um, used to be the three CCD cameras. But uh, yeah, video gain, ISO sensitivity are just equivalent. Well, frames per second are the fields or frames per second. Fields is a little bit outdated. What is a field? Why do we say field and frame? Field is that one I, uh, I just mentioned in the beginning, whereby half of the lines were taken out. So uh, that was called the field at the time. So when you say field means that half of the lines are out. And frames is a complete frame. Okay. Um, well, in photography, actually, you have pretty much uh, fr flexibility to have any aspect ratio. In case of videography, um, 16 to 9 is the most dominant and prevailing formats nowadays. Either whether we are talking about 4K or full high definition, uh, both of them, actually, even high definition alone, is also 16 to 9. But standard definition, gee, you know, most of you are younger than me. But 20 years back, I remember when we switched on the cathode ray tube TV, that was standard definition because there was nothing else, actually, at that time. And it was 4 to 3. The aspect ratio was 4 to 3. So it was more of a square type. You know, not exactly, but more of a square type. That 
makes us in video thinking sometimes that, well, we need to keep this in mind that yes, 4K, full high definition, high definition are all having the same aspect, aspect ratio 16 to 9. But if for any reason you're going to mix, to mingle your video with some old video, then you need to consider that you might have to deal with a 4 to 3. It's not easy to deal with such situation, you know, because you have to crop your, your frame in this case to match, to have a match. And the formats of the files are JPEG, TIFF, or NEF. Here you have data mov, .aic. So, uh, yeah, moving to the control of the camera, especially starting with the light. Um, the camera in video has a po definitely a possibility to control your amount of light. That's primarily what is very important with any camera, whether being a photography or videography. That's how a camera can see the image primarily through the light reflected from the subject. So more amount of light, then better image control. And um, yeah, one of the big advantages that we have with this camera here is that it has the biggest mount. Biggest mount means more light getting in, as simple physics applies. And it means eventually that you have the highest possible signal to noise ratio means the highest possible quality of video or image in general. So that's where we're starting from, the, your lens, the quality of your lens, and your mount size, which will allow eventually a bigger uh, flow of light falling on your sensor. But at the end of the day, the same parameters that applies for photography applies for videography. That's why I'm not going to go deep into this, but we have the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And in a camera like that, which is even classified uh, by um, uh, you know, unbiased organization like Petapixel or whatever, like a best video camera, but still we are using those terminologies for video. So we still have to control the three parameters while we are shooting in order to master our amount of light captured and master also the movement as well and control the movement the way we want. And in order to do that, it's good in case of video specifically just to leave it on the manual mode so you have a full control on your parameters of, of your camera. Okay. And one thing just I felt many have a, a little bit of uh, confusion uh, between the shutter speed and the frame rate are two different things actually. Uh, related, but they are different. Um, so the frame rate is the number of pictures per second and your shutter speed still with the same concept as videography applies, as photography applies to videography. It's the amount where your shutter opens, whether here we are not talking about the mechanical shutter obviously. Okay? Once we are in video, the sh mechanical shutter is opened and it's just an electronic shutter. But uh, your shutter opens, allow the light to fall on, on your sensor and close down again, again electronically. So all is happening electronically, but again, it's the same, it's the same concept. So you have a shutter speed, which has the same meaning like photography, okay? But the thing here is that if we look at our camera here, And, oh yeah, we have a shutter, uh, where are my shutter speeds? My shutter speed here cannot go beyond one over 50 of a second. Do you know why? Somebody can tell me why. One fifty of a second is my shutter speed setting and I cannot go beyond this. I can go faster, but I cannot go slower than this. One over 50 of a second, yeah. You are answering all my questions, yes. Because of the frame rate, absolutely. Because the frame rates were 50 frames per second, right? So you cannot let your frame open, your sensor open for a duration longer than what your frame is going, the next frame is going to come and say, hey, wait, take it away, next frame is coming. So you can't let it open for more than one over 50 of a second. Okay. So, so that's 
that is why we, we have a type of relation. They are related to some extent, but they are not the same thing. Okay? If we go here to our menu, and we find that we are set on 50, sorry, 50p. Okay? So that is the reason, and that's how we relate number of frames per second and the shutter speed. But what is the best shutter speed if I have the option? Well, there is a golden rule here from the days of cinema when there was a mechanical shutter till now. It's that you, put, you could put, set your shutter speed as inverse twice of your frame rate. So if you have your frame rate 24, you set one over 48. So if we have 50 frames per second, what could be the ultimate shutter speed? One over 100, right? So that is a ideal shutter speed in terms of movement, not of light, obviously. We don't talk here about the light. This formula is for movement, regular movement. You can change. The shutter speed could have been set automatically by the camera like that, but it, le it is leaving it to you to change. You change it according to the, the speed of your movement, same like photography, okay? So you according to what you have, you can, change, you can change your shutter speed to the way you want people to see the picture, okay? So that again, it depends on you, but I'm saying ultimately, ultimately you can start from a point whereby your shutter speed is the inverse twice of your uh, frame rate, okay? Or an image like that, okay? Aperture is again another factor, and here uh, there is a, an important note. Please, please, this is video, not photography. You don't click a picture and that's it. You take a video. And if you are zooming while you're doing video, okay, you should not change your aperture. So be careful of what type of lenses you are using while you are filming, okay? Sorry, that's a note which is down beneath that, okay? So that's very important, please. Do not use um, zoom lens where aperture change when you use changing the zoom. If you're filming, then you cannot really control your, your, your exposure as such. Moving to ISO, here we have a setting I personally consider it good, important. I use it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, you know, classified as a professional videographer, but uh, I find it actually very useful in videography and photography as well. But um, it just changes the, the sensitivity automatically. So that's an auto ISO type, okay? What ISO is said by video people? Again, thank you. So on the camera, it's ISO. So uh, auto ISO in video, I think it's beneficial. Of course, when I talk to video guys, like we have Erdi is going to follow me. He's really a broadcast engineer, just, you know, the guy who, who really does deal with, with the utmost uh, edge of technology. Then uh, probably he would say, no, I don't use this. So it depends, but I, I find this very useful. It's going to change your ISO setting according to the light ambience that you have. That's quite useful, especially if you're starting video. Okay, and an important parameter, I, I felt many people, even those who are mastering light, sometimes they don't know this. But just to keep it in mind, you know, then if you have a source of light, uh, light is a wave propagating everywhere. And while it propagates, it loses intensity, right? If I turn uh, a 1,000 watt light in front of your eyes right now, you're going to be, you know, extremely disturbed. But if I go stand in a one kilometer away, it won't affect you probably, isn't it? So distance matters, why? Because the light spreads all around, it's simple, I mean, it's, it's just logic. The light goes everywhere. And that's a, uh, that's a power of laser. Laser doesn't do that. Laser just goes in a straight line, and that's why it maintains its intensity from here, even to the moon surface, it keeps maintaining its intensity, approximately. But here, in this case, in, in, in a normal light, okay, the, the light just spreads away. 
And because it spreads away, it starts to weaken out. That's why any flash in photography says uh, you shouldn't go beyond 18 meters, let's say. Of course, all, all that is subjective to the amount, existing amount of light, to the positioning, to the angle, to many things. But it's definitely one of the very important factors. The distance of your light to your subject is going to affect significantly uh, your, uh, your illumination of your subject. So uh, let's say I have a source of light right here. Okay, and you're away one meter from me. So the gentleman there is away two meters. What's the difference between the amount of light received by you and you? Pardon me? Yes, how much? How many times? Let's say one meter, two meters. One fourth, okay? It it changes not linearly, so not, not half, okay? One fourth, right? And three meters, nine times, okay? It's inverse low uh, rule, okay? So an inverse square low rule. Inverse square low rule is a common physics, not, apply, not applicable only to, uh, to light, okay? It applies also to sounds that we're going just to going to touch upon uh, right now. So it's the same. Let's say if you have a flash and you bounce a flash back, so it just goes on the wall and come back on your subject. You assume that it goes, you know, to 25% of the amount if you would have subjected directly to your uh, to your subject straight away. So please note, light does not weaken linearly. It weakens, um, you know with a square pattern. Well, uh, many, many common factors are applicable in uh, photography and videography when it, when it comes to light. Uh, we have the three, um, three point lighting setup. Uh, you, you, you do know that, I guess. Um, many of the photographers have been exposed to the three points light and maybe we can have a chance, opportunities to talk about that later on by photographers. It's the same applicable to videography. The only thing you need to know is that you have a continuous light. You definitely cannot use flashes in video. Flashes, no, no one. And these LED lights are really quite efficient. Tomorrow pro probably we are going to see a thorough demonstration by Ra, who is going to uh, explain also how to control and master all those lights, the angles, the color, and all those too, too many factors that you need to look at when you're doing your filming. But uh, the good thing about the majority of these, they are matrices and then you can, you can choose the one which is convenient to you. Most of them are operated by battery. So you can charge the battery and play anywhere. So, uh, and they are more white as well. So it's easy to control your white balance. So these are the advantage of this type of lights. Okay. And some of them are adaptable on the camera. Okay, so let's uh, jump over. That's a three, uh, three points lighting set up a camera here. Subject is here. You have one light in the background and you have one fill and one key light. There is a definition. What is the meaning of fill and key as well? Okay. You have a four uh, light setup whereby you want to create a layers, you know, to create a depth in your picture. So you enlighten around, not only the subject which creates uh, depth in your in your filming or your image equally, it's the same, you know. And all of these are very good to use, you know, whenever you can. The reflectors, umbrella, softbox, diffusers, and bounce loud. Soft, softbox and diffuser are pretty much the same physical thing. Um, they, they just soften the light, so converting a key light into a soft light, you know. Uh, bouncing light, umbrella, and reflectors are very good in video. Why? Because they do not change, uh, if you are using the silver one, of course, they do not change your color temperature. Okay, so uh, even though color temperature in video is a different thing compared to photography. Photography, I would say it's a very good selection to set your camera on auto and leave it to go. The camera will, trust me, do a good job and will select the right uh, situation. When it comes to video, no matter where you are, 
in a room or outside. You could be even shooting outside. The sun will be there in moments the clouds can come and cover it. It's not going to change only the amount of light. It's going to change also the temperature of the light. Okay? And if you, if you are filming across a sunset or a sunrise, which is very common actually uh, in terms of selecting the time of filming, uh, then that also even during that time, every minute your color balance is changing. So you need really to calibrate and choose uh, carefully your color balance when you're doing filming. And um, you, you probably, in any situation, you need to uh, calibrate and correct and select precisely your color balance. Okay. And to do that also, it's good to have a little bit of a background on the, on the uh, lighting uh, colors. You know, if you have an incandescent light, which is approximately 2,700 Kelvin, or a fluorescent 3,500, or, um, or a fluorescent, uh, which is uh, 5,500 Kelvin. And you can set your camera straight away with a number if, if you have only that source of light. Okay? The other thing with videos that you could be having a variety of source of lights. Like here, we are affected with a blue light, with an orange light, with a rosy light, and with the incandescent light. All these are mixed. So if I'm filming over here, I'm influenced by the mix of all these lights. So I need to make a separate color balance, Don't, not to mix, not to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, confuse the camera. Especially if we are moving our camera across, then the color balance is going to change from that spot which is affected by blue to that spot which is affected by orange. So you need to keep that in mind. And it shouldn't happen that within your filming that color temperature change is wrong. If you are doing that for a professional use, you're probably risking to get your film uh, useless. Okay, so please note this. And some of the light sources have a mix even of uh, Kelvins. So uh, at the end, it, it just goes to the same thing that we need to make a proper color calibration balance. I'm sorry, sorry. Okay, so we're going to jump over here. Uh, common mistakes is that don't judge the, uh, the, the, the amount of light by your eyes. The amount of light is good or bad, don't, don't do that. In probably you ne ne necessarily have to use the color meters, whether the built-in inside the camera or external ones, okay? Uh, avoid the too hard light, which, which gives probably a more dramatic look. Uh, probably, unless you're doing really that on purpose, then it's possible, but if you're not, then better to be careful on the hard light. Hard light means a point source light, which is too strong and is not getting diffused before reaching. Probably like a sun is a type of uh, hard light. Um, avoid image to be flat, so please create a depth using your lighting. And as I said, uh, temperature, light temperature. So monitoring your exposure is extremely important and essential. It is essential in video. Do not risk to spoil your video by not really monitor monitoring your exposure. Okay. So if you if you are you might be just depending on what you might be saying. You know what? I'm my application. I'm I'm vlogger, and all what I'm doing is I just I'm that's what I'm doing. That's all which is fine. Still, you can do that. But you would activate you know, the zebra pattern. Zebra pattern is common in video. So it's not just said or named like that in the Z series of cameras. Since probably more than 30 years, it's called the same, the zebra pattern. A zebra pattern will appear on when you have a high light, when, when your light becomes too high. So it gives you an indication, hey, be careful. You, you're going into a high light, and later on, you might not be able to get it down again. It becomes all white, all same level. So no matter what you do on your post-production, you're not going to differentiate it again. So in this case, you might be just losing the clouds, the beautiful clouds here forever. That's it, gone. So it just gives you an indication whereby you can activate, uh, activate your zebra, uh, giving you an indication that, hey, something is probably going wrong and you need to take an action for it. I'll come back to this on the camera, but just to say that you have another way of monitoring your exposure through the histogram, activating the histogram on your camera, 
would be another way to also monitor your, get a sense of what is your exposure, what is your lighting, you know, and do the necessary measures. If you find that uh, that type of, of uh, curve moves towards the right, then you, you probably have an alarming situation. You, know, and you need to take the measures for it. Uh, please note that if you're heading for a pro video and you're doing a shoot, even if, let's say, you are a vlogger, let's say, the simplest type of video application as a business, I'm saying, you know, you're probably traveling somewhere. You are asked to go to Oman to do a coverage and vlog. Uh, that's a cost for you, you know. You, you pay the ticket. You, you're paying a hotel and you're spending time over there. That's a cost. That's a money. You don't want to spoil it at the end of the day by going back onto your station and finding that, oh, I done a big problem and then I have to stay one more day. That's the simplest imagination. If you haven't even used other uh, investments during that day itself to, to end up with the video that you have, uh, could be whatever, models, props, setups, you know, nobody knows. It goes up to if you are shooting a film or a movie and you have an actor, you're paying him I don't know how much per day, but that probably is much more expensive than your ticket or your hotel. Uh, you don't want to end up with a spoiled video, okay? So please be careful. That's extremely important how you monitor your exposure. Well, the third type of monitoring is using something called a waveform. A waveform, again, is one of the ways of monitoring your exposure in video on a professional level, so they, they have a waveform. But the waveform is not available on a camera right now, so the waveform can be triggered, in our case, if you are recording on a separate external device, like the Ninja uh, monitor recorder, then in this case, you are capable of activating uh, the waveform to be superimposed on your image. I'll try to show it if we have time. Uh, yeah, but, but to just uh, activate your zebra. I forgot. So in, in this camera, we have two patterns. God knows why we have this and that. I don't know. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, probably it just, if in case, it, it just coincides with some pattern that you are shooting. So you might select the other one, you know. But uh, yeah, why they did two patterns like that, not too sure. But nevertheless, if we select one of these patterns, then we have another selection is a threshold. To what extent you are going to ask your camera to show that pattern? Okay. Uh, wh when do you want the camera to show it like that? At what level? You know. Do you remember the quantization that we mentioned about? So the quantization is uh, converting into a digital significance your your sample, and your light is going to be displayed in that sense from a level uh, starting from uh, obviously 0 to, to 55 
but uh, you can select to whichever point you want the camera to do the threshold means show this it depends on on the situation if you are if you are very careful let's say if I'm, you want to be so safe so you might you might select which one if you want to be so safe which value you would go for 180 absolutely thank you yeah that's uh, maximum safety because you're telling the camera once the the highlights reach to 180 show me this so I'll be very careful and then I'll take my 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 measures uh, I'll have a time to correct myself you know uh, but if no, and you, if you are mastering the situation better, then you can get the camera to warn you in a higher level, okay? And do you know why we have 255? Does anybody can guess why the maximum level is 255? But why, why 255? White means uh, white means no details, but why two five five specifically as a number? White. It's white. That's true. That's true. Do you remember how many bits we have? Eight. So how many quantization level does it give us? Two five six. So including the zero, it gets to two five five, which is two to the power eight. Okay. So that's that's the origin of it. Well, uh, I don't have much time to stop. <laughs> really, I have to just mention something about sound at least. Sorry, I didn't time probably. I rehearsed on a faster note. I don't know what faster could be, but yeah, that's how I did. Um, well, I'll skip picture control. I'm sure Rao is going to cover that tomorrow. Um, but all what I want to say here is that if you're taking your film without a post color correction, you know, uh, then you, you might go for a vivid color like that. It's too, too rich in colors, right? Like that. Um, but you might select less color if you plan to do a post-processing later on. So you're going to control yourself the amount of color. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the difference. Like that, again, is a vivid landscape or a vivid picture. So you can take it straight away, okay? Like that. But that's the difference. You cannot do a post-processing in, in, in pictures like that. You cannot do a post-processing here in terms of color management, color uh, correction. You cannot correct colors. All colors are to the maximum intensity. Okay? So just be careful on this. It depends on whether you're planning strongly to have a post-processing or not. That will define. But be careful. If you are planning to post-process, so don't push your camera intensity to the maximum. Uh, you know, you want to end up with films like that rather than like that. Okay. That's post-processing uh, corrected. The colors are corrected in post-processing. So if you leave it, if you leave it that way, then probably you leave the, uh, a gap for yourself to control further your colors. Sorry, I'll just go for five minutes. Uh, I'm talking about the sound. The sound again. The starting point is that again. Today, when we were just starting, once I came to test the sound, okay, so what are we doing? I'm talking here, and we have probably the speaker set behind me somewhere here. And uh, Miss Ola, to, to, to check uh, whether that sound is okay, she goes to the end, you know, so to the end because, again, it's a wave which weakens as it propagates. So the first row, probably I don't need to use a mic, to use to use a, such an, an instrument, but probably going further, then yes, you need that. So sound again reduces while it propagates, and it's the same. So it goes again with the same, uh, you know, proportionality light like light. You know, it's an inverse square law. So the more it propagates, the more it weakens, and that is very important for us to consider. Uh, how are we going to position our mics for a scene or for an interview or for whichever uh, filming that we are doing? Well, positioning the mics is very critical um, for what sounds we want to pick. Okay? Um, if we are now streaming my talk online, 
So we need to be sure that the sound is picked correctly, and that's why I have a mic here, right? Nobody's going to put place the mic somewhere there in a the corner of the room. The mic has to be here, the closest possible to my voice, so that the voice could be picked the clearest possible. So distance is a very, very important factor in collecting or picking the sound, whether it is a voice or another instrument, whichever, uh, and reproducing the value, okay? So um, that's one, one element of it, but, um, uh, you know, the camera, the camera has a built-in mic in it, but uh, that mic has more of a, a pattern like that, it's called omnidirectional. It picks a sound from different angles with an equivalent amount. But uh, directional mics have a different characteristics. They are picking the sound from a direction, from, where, from, from the direction where they are pointed to more than other directions. So that gives a more selectivity, okay? Then uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm filming now, you know, if I'm filming in this room, and I'm careful about picking the sound from wherever I'm pointing, then the mic will help me to get this selection instead of just depending on the built-in mic of the camera. So these mics also are important to uh, have a spatial selectivity of the sound, okay? So that's one way of doing it. It can't be compared to the efficiency of using um, a wireless mic as such, you know, those are the most, most efficient. But those are good for interviews, right? Or for a session like that, I can talk with a mic and you can film me, there's no problem. But you cannot do drama with this, right? Actors cannot come with, with, with wireless mics that way. It do, never works like that. And for that, you need um, a boom mic, it's called like that. I've probably seen them in, in movies, in the behind the scenes, where they're standing and, and pointing the mic but of course, your frame must avoid uh, the, the image of the mic there. So uh, in, in, in cinema industry or movie industry, you unavoidably have to use that setup, the boom mic, in order to, be, to have the proximity of sound collection you know, with a proper mic <coughs> and obviously not using a wireless mic. Okay? So that's the difference. Okay? Interview is no problem, it's okay. The interview is fine. Uh, no, no, nobody's going to, to make fun on, on that, okay? Well, different type of sounds. I have to show this. But before getting into that, uh, just what I want to say is that um, the audio has an important factor, which is level of sound. I can talk with a high tone or a low tone, okay? The amplitude is changing. You can put an amplifier, which can also amplifies my sound much more. That is an amplitude. But there's another factor which is a frequency, okay? So the frequency is, is again another factor which defines how your uh, unit is going to, uh, to capture your sound. So you have an uh, application actually which is, uh, which is a tone generator, you know? So uh, anybody can download it. And uh, you can select the frequency, right? and the volume as well. Well, but fixing the volume, you can have different frequencies. These are the frequencies, okay? I'm changing the frequency, probably that you cannot hear. Because our ears have also a pattern of receiving. So very high frequencies and very low frequencies, that's uh, approximately 20 kilohertz, our ears cannot hear. Maybe a very young child can, but you know, more than that you cannot. So these are the frequencies. That's, again, another factor in audio, an important factor. And you have a set of frequencies which you can download from the internet and get to know what frequency matches what. <coughs> and which instr musical instruments can do whatever. But something very important to you that you need to know is that approximately around the one to four kilohertz is the human voice, okay, my voice. Is, is a band, it's not one frequency, it's not like one tone like I showed. It's a, it's a, it's a group of frequencies all together, but that lies probably between one kilohertz and four kilohertz, okay? One to four kilohertz. And yeah, ladies are a little bit shifted, like uh, 500 hertz more, okay? But that's more or less the human being bandwidth of frequencies. So 
If you have a frequency starting from 0 to 20 kilohertz, like I just mentioned right now, so human vocal starts from 500 hertz approximately to 3 kilohertz, and that's what was old telephones. You know, they, they had that bandwidth. You were talking on line telephone at that time. So uh, why I want to show that is that in your camera, you can actually, if you are doing an interview, first let's go to the monitor sensitivity. And as you can see, as I am talking, the monitor uh, is displaying the intensity of my voice. If I'm going to go further, then of course it's going to be weakening and uh, closer it's going to get higher. It's not linear, that's a dB scale, means a decibel scale, so don't look at it on a linear, as a linear scale. But it is important to look at that, and that scale exactly can be superimposed on your video. So while you are filming, you can see that scale, and it's so important. Again, same like exposure. You can spoil your video with the sound. Sound in video is 50% of the information. Okay, don't take it lightly. Exactly as a video is important, the, the visual comp component is important, audible component is equally important. You cannot mess with it. So what is important here is that you should not end up with, you should not end up with a, a, a red sign, okay? A, a red mark here, which I'll just show it. Yeah, so if you get close to, very close to the, the camera, I might easier get my phone. Then you get the red marks, and that's very, very, very dangerous, okay? See, you, you definitely need to maintain your sound, whether it's a voice or whatever you intend to do, within the middle here, okay? That's where you can reproduce it and deal with it in a, in a, ni in a good way. But, um, maximum if you go too high if you go too low first like here in this case sorry well that the minimum here is the sound of the air condition so I will change manually the sensitivity in that situation, your signal is very weak. You might be able to amplify it, but you're going to add on noise, okay? So you might recover it, but uh, not high quality, okay? Uh, but on the other hand, if you get it in a red like that, that's so dangerous. Probably you cannot even recover it. You know, you get your sound to be saturated, clipped. Your, your signal is going to be clipped and you can't recover it ever. Okay, so be careful, never reach to that. Never ever reach to that, okay? And that's a manual setting up of your sensitivity. So in case you know what sensitivity you are looking for, you can set it up manually. Or alternatively, if you want to leave it on auto, then you're leaving it to the camera to adjust what sensitivity according to the intensity of sound received, okay? What you can do as well, if you're doing an interview, interview means you're using human voice. So you can select vocal range, okay, which is going to select only the human frequencies. Other frequencies are going to be attenuated and eliminated. So you can utilize that to be more selective if you're doing an interview or a discussion or a forum or whatever, or if it is like a speech like that, you know. So because all what you're picking here is a voice of a human, not a music or uh, not a sound uh, of the ambience. Yeah, so a headphone is related to, to the headphone, so please be careful that you need, to, you need to monitor your sound as well. You need to monitor it visually, like I mentioned right now, and you need to moni monitor it as well, I'm sorry, uh, and, and you need to monitor it by a headphone. If you are serious filming something that you need to make sure that, no, 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 even, even watching it, I'm not 
trusting that enough. That could be the voice of the human or it could be a, a voice of something else, so, or a sound of something else, so better to have that set up. Uh, I'll stop at this stage. Sorry, took too much time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's have a 30 minutes break, and we come here back by 6.20. Yeah. Six ten? Yeah, six ten, yeah, six ten. And uh, maybe we can postpone the questions and answers to the end. If you have any questions even for Mr. Tariq, he will be there to answer your questions. Yes, sure. Thank you. Nowadays, it's, I guess, all cameras will probably have that.
have set over here, okay? Do you have any videos to play? Yeah, it's already inside. Can we test for another video? Uh, I'll just click now. Hello.
as I put it here. Yeah, yes. Yeah, please. I think I will not do any yeah, demo anymore because it will take time. I, I, I'm supposed to have a demo. Okay. Yeah, please.
Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Erdelfo Ilao. Uh, in Tagalog, it's actually in Filipino, you call it light. OK. So um, I'm here tonight and uh, teaching you about uh, advanced videography. Um, I am interlinking the, uh, the idea of uh, Mr. Tarik uh, with regards to the basics of uh, video. OK. Um, uh, shall we start? Are you good? OK. So first of all, uh, I'd like to ask you a questions about this, OK? Why? Because most of us here are actually interested in creating a video, right? OK? You, are, you guys are here. Maybe you guys want to do blogging. You guys want to do doing something, OK? But let me ask you a question. Why would you like to do a video? OK, over here, please. Just make this conversational, OK? Anyone here? OK. Documentation, yes. Go ahead. Exactly. What else? To tell story. Actually, the guy over here is actually correct. Oh, what happened to the phones? I think the, the presentation. It's OK. It's OK. No problem. The font when I was when the, my presentation was transferred to the PC uh, went a little bit bad. OK. So it's because of a message, actually. Most of us, when we do blogging, when we do lots of things, it's because we want to have a message. We want to impart something as a message for everyone, for our, for our audience. OK? This creation of message are actually based on ingredients that actually, based on my experience, I've been in a journalism for several years in the biggest uh, uh, TV station in the Philippines, which is ABS-CBN. Okay, I've been there for somehow quite several years, almost two decades. So when I came here, I continued my passion for videography. Okay, so during this time of uh, creating videos for news and current affairs, I've created some sort of ingredients for me to somehow deliver this message across clearly and efficiently, OK? First of this message is uh, our videos has to be planned carefully. It should be planning and conceptualization have to be in place, OK? Because it's very important. One of the best thing, even if you go out and do something, shoot a video, if you don't have a plan, nothing will happen. You could end up doing nothing and waste your time, OK? Sufficient lighting, OK? When Mr. Tariq a while ago was explaining about lights, it's very, very important for us. When we were in use in current affairs, every time we go for an ocular inspection, OK, in events and uh, several other things, most of the priority that we have is about the light's sufficiency, OK? It's very important. The second thing is favorable background. Background is very important. Later on, we will be dealing with it. Okay. Clear sound, as what Mr. Tarek said a while ago. Okay. Stable footage. Composition. The way how you take your shots, it's very, very important. Okay. Camera presence. If you want to put someone on your video, you want to ask someone to speak about something, you want to interview someone, at least put something with pleasing personality. If you want to have a, a subject like an animal or something, make it more beautiful. OK? This is what we call camera presence. OK? And last but not the least, OK? It's a good editing tool. You guys can have free editing tools. You can have DaVinci. You can have Final Cut. Pro X or 10, Adobe Premiere. There's a lot of, uh, of editing tools that we can have. Some are paid, some are actually free. OK? So let me ask you something. What is the effect of video in our audience? As when you are creating something, what is the effect? OK? Anyone could guess. OK. OK. Anyone else? Yes, exactly. Sometimes when we are watching something, 
you are with your wife having dinner or with your husband having dinner. And you are, there's a TV turned on, and suddenly you just can't stop looking at it, right? And even if your wife or husband is saying, hey, I was telling something, what, what, are you listening? This is because you are immersed. Because the effect of video is actually immersive. Okay, sometimes without uh, realizing, you are actually immersed already in what you are watching. Okay? And what is the effect of sound? Okay? You can feel it. You can, right? Okay. Any, any, anyone could guess? Okay, because it's engaging. Okay? This is actually when you are engaged, you feel, you tend to somehow go beat with the sound. If you listen to the music, go dance with it sometime. Okay? And actually, if you combine being immersed and engaged, our video will be really cool because it will be an entertainment for everyone. That is the purpose, actually, <laughs> of creating video, right? We want people to be entertained, whether it's a blog, whether it's a documentary. Somehow, the message has to be entertaining for you to sustain your viewers, right? Okay, I want you guys to, I, I was commissioned to do something for one Dragon Boat team a while ago. And let me play you with this, okay? Let me play this video for you. Where is the... Attention. So that video, when, uh, when they saw it, it was a mixture of thanking me and uh, somehow, it was overwhelming somehow because uh, it was one time when I made it and they said, oh, cool, let's publish it. And it, you can find it in, uh, in their uh, Instagram, an A-Team's uh, Dragon Boat team in their Instagram. Okay, so that is how we make our video. I've been creating video for some sort of projects and I will, you will see it in a little while along the way. So, getting ready. I think everyone knows, especially for, for the photographers who are already here, but for the beginners, uh, with, for your benefits, okay? So, getting ready is very important. Guys, you have to read the manual of your camera. This is very important. I had, a, I had an instance that when I, one guy was with me shooting for the first time, I didn't know him. It was my first acquaintance with him and then asking me how to go for the settings. And even me, I also don't know because I haven't used the camera for quite some time. So I don't know also. So please read your manual, okay? This is very important. Okay, be prepared. I will just go fast with this. Full charged battery, okay, battery charger. Okay, at least spare memory cards. Lens cleaning cloth, it's very important. A tripod, okay, duct tape. It might sound so silly, guys, but you know what? In one of the instances, one actor in the Philippines died because of just a loose cable running around from one end to another. He's a very famous guy. Just because of a fighting scene in the same company which I used to work with before, he was running carrying a rifle because it was a fight scene, and suddenly he flipped over, banged his head, broke his neck, and died on the spot. He died at 90 years old. He didn't see that. See, duct tape maybe look silly, but it's very, very important. Okay? Lens filter. In daytime, especially on videography, you will be limited for a shutter speed of 50 and 100 for ISO. Sometimes this kind of settings may require filter. 
So when you are on the ground shooting something, filter is very, very important. Okay? So be prepared. Create a storyboard. Because I don't know how to draw, I ended up getting pictures relevant to what I truly likes to shoot. Okay? So I can easily say it to my client, saying that, okay, this is the way how we do the shots. Okay, this is the way how we represent the shots. And it's effective, by the way. And it's time efficient. You don't need to draw a sketch and say, okay, I need to do this. And suddenly, your client would say, ah, I don't like that shot. Change it. So you have to re-sketch again. Unlike this one, you just simply get from internet, get something, a relevant shot, and that's good. That's good enough for them. Okay? So, soundtrack is a very important subject. Uh, uh, one, it's a key important factor of your video creation because sometimes you prepare first the audio or the sound. Sometimes I download it to my phone and when I take the shots, I just listen to that before I take the actual shots. Because it is where, when you are editing your video, it is where the bits of shifts of video comes from. Right? For, for guys here who already started editing, it is the subject, you know, the, the bit, it is there where you cut your videos. And it's very important, you can easily measure your shots, the time, how long you will take the shots, okay? So, settings, this is where we're going a little bit deeper on, on what Mr. Tarek has been telling you about a while ago, okay? White balance. Okay, let me ask you something, guys. Uh, okay, we, we just go ahead this one first, okay? ISO, okay? So sensor sensitivity, okay? Aperture, which is, that defines depth of field or de DOF, okay? Shutter speed, okay? Defines how much motion blur in each frame of the video, okay? And frame rate, I will reinforce that idea before that what have Mr. Mr. Tarek spoke to you about, the frame rate, okay? the number of individual frames or images that are displayed, okay, per second from your camera recording, okay? So, white balance, let me ask you something. If you combine these three colors, what do you think you will end up with? White. Perfect, okay? White, exactly. Because uh, actually our camera can recognize only three colors. It's just a matter of the combination of these three primary colors that creates a different color or information within your camera, okay? So, question again. Can you take a video shots from this, a 2,000 Kelvin of color, color temperature to 9,000? Do you think you can shoot on this range of color temperature? Yes. Of course, but ideally, we can only actually, especially on studio, this is the most ideal spectrum of color temperature that you should shoot within. If you are familiar with bicolor LED lights or any other kinds of lights, if you will notice, there is only 3,200 Kelvin to 5,600 Kelvin, right? because it's the most ideal color temperature that you can take your video on, okay? So, ISO. By the way, guys, can I ask you what is ISO means? Okay. Uh, come again, say again. Yeah, what, what does ISO means? Okay, what else? Uh, Okay, but the meaning actually is derived from a Greek word, means equal, isos, it means equal. Some people say international standardization organization is actually wrong, okay? So, so this is just a history of it. It's taken from a Greek word, isos, means equal, okay? So from this amount of light, okay, to that lesser amount of light, Actually, you can take a shot with your ISO settings down here, okay? Here, you can have 50 to 100, okay? 
I think most of the photographers already know about this. Okay? Take a shot. And uh, here, the good thing about Nikon uh, cameras, actually, they can go through here. 51,200 ISO. Okay? Let me move forward on this. Okay, aperture, of course, defines depth of field, which is this one. The number here is actually inversely proportional. If your aperture number is high, it means your aperture iris is actually closed already. Okay? It's actually almost closed. Pinhole sometimes for some of the camera. Okay? So that's why here it's 22, it's closed, and it's here it's lesser number, it's wide open. This is the excitement goes around here, okay? Shutter speed defines how much motion blur is there in each frame of the video, okay? If, let me give you an example about 24 frames per second, okay? Here, actually your electronic shutter on your camera closes and open in, in, in such a particular length of time. Here, when you have 24 frames per second, here it's actually, per, per frame here, it's actually closes and open. Okay? Moving forward, here, this, if you want to have a blurry shot on your video, if you pull down your shutter speed here to 40 or 30 or 25, you tend to have some sort of blurriness on your video. I'm going to show you a little example in a little while. Okay? And here, if you want to have like sort of strobing video that has an effect like too fast, try to jack up your shutter speed to this, sometimes 500 or 1,000. You will feel it. But the 180 rule says that to simulate the human eye experience, is we have to make it to the nearest times two of your frame rate, which is this one here. Okay, your frame rate here is 24, but because you don't have a 48 setting of shutter, we tend to go for 50. Okay, let me give you an example. Okay, let me play you this video for you to realize how is it really. Take a look at it. It has a 50, 1 over 50th of a second, 1 over 30th of a second, 250, and 1,000. Okay, let me go back to that video. I'm going here. Okay. If you see here, this is 50. This is actually the human eye experience because our frame rate here was supposedly 24 or 25. Okay. Here, you will see a little bit of a blurriness because your shutter speed is kicked down to very, a little bit low from the normal, okay? And here, if you can see, it's almost, there's no motion blur in it, and especially for this one. It's so clear that in actual video, it's actually strobing. There's a strobing effect on it, okay? <clears throat> so let me continue with this. The frame rate refers to the number of individual frames or images that are displayed per second from your camera recording. How is it like? Okay, how is it? So imagine this is your one second here. That frame rate is actually the information that you put from first frame of your video till the last. This is sometimes 60 or 30. You see the gaps over here. So you'll see when you have a 24 frames per second, and for the, for the people who are doing now editing, if you do a slow-mo video on it, if you tend to slow it down, you will see some jerks, right? You will see it. It's because the information that you have placed per second here is too less compared to this one, okay? That's why there are slow-mo recording that has 120 FPS, right? That is actually the essence of it, okay? So here, the frame rate refers to this one. I'm again giving you the example of 24 frames per second. Okay, this is the duration, and this is the next second of your duration. Sometimes you record for 10 seconds, you record for 20 seconds, 
So this is a continuation of it. First slice of one second, the second slice of the next second. It's continuously going through, okay? So let me give you a scenario here because uh, refresh rate of a monitors for actual video shooting has always been an issue for video shooters, okay? I was commissioned to do a shoot a while ago before, I, it was around two weeks ago. So using an LED screen is actually, sorry I have to mask all those faces of the characters, of the subjects here because they are very important people by the way, they are VVIPs. So if you see at the background of the picture, there are LED screens, huge LED screens set up. This is usually a challenge for all the shooters for the videographers doing a, a live events, for the videographers who does documentary for corporate events, this is usually a big problem for them. Okay? Let me give you an example of this. Okay. When I was shooting this, it looked like this. Sorry, I have to mask the face of the person. What you can see here is an acceptable, a very unacceptable video. Okay, why? Come on, no one will accept that you are being paid for to shoot a good video and uh, you will give this kind of video that it's kalas. You don't have business anymore tomorrow. Okay, so make it perfect. So how do we resolve this? Let me play again one video for you. Okay, so immediately when I realized that I have a, an issue on the flickering because the refresh rate of that LED screen behind the person talking is 60 frames per second, okay? Immediately, I tried to do something. In just a snap of a second, I realized, because I know how to do it, so it ended up this way, okay? So take a look now. So it's smooth, it's, the flicker was gone, and when he changed the slide, somehow I didn't catch it because it was a split of a second, so the flicker is gone. So how did I do it? Okay. First, there are considerations here because either you have to break the 180 degree rule because I was supposedly recording at 50 frames per second. So either you have to do it this way, you have to shutter speed, uh, the set the shutter speed to 1 over 60th of a second. Okay. But the point here is you are breaking the the 180 degree rule, because your frame rate is already 50 frames per second. So what I did is different, okay? I set the, uh, the camera to NTSC, which is 60p, for me to go along with the recording of the LED screen, and that was the result. I didn't, I didn't uh, break my shutter speed rule of 180 degree, but instead, I used NTSC as a mitigation for that issue, okay? So, the thing is, to explain the science of this, just for you guys, this very fast, okay? The thing is, when I realized that is, this is the, the refresh rate, 60 hertz per second of that monitor, okay? It is happening very rapidly that you will notice it. Only your camera will see it, okay? This is 60, okay? That, that refresh rate of the LED screen is 60, and my frame rate at that time was 50, okay? What happened is, why it is flickering? Because you only have one match of it, okay? Here, only in the middle, see? That 30, you divide it, is a division of 60. In the middle, there's only one match of all those rapid frame rates is happening in your video, right? You get the point? So this is the only match. So along the way, when you are repeating all this one second of your recording, those refresh rates are happening in the background and your camera can see it. It doesn't synchronize with your frame rate. So what is happening is a flicker, right? Okay? So <clears throat> let me go back a little bit to a history of this. Right? Because most of us forget the basics and wonder why specifics doesn't work. Okay? 
Um, this is actually in conjunction with what uh, Mr. Tarek was explaining about in a little while, but this is a little more uh, deeper on this. I think you guys know this guy. Amazing. Wow. So he's actually my favorite scientist, by the way. His name is Nikola Tesla. And he was the guy who invented the modern alternating current, okay, or AC. Okay. This power that you can have here now is actually an alter alternating current. The, the lights that you can see is powered by AC. Okay? So, what is an alternating current here? An electricity current that reverses its direction many times a second, a regular interval, typically used in power supplies. It's simple, straightforward. Okay? In the videography platform, you will see all these lights here, like incandescent lamp, especially during indoor shooting. Okay? this kind of lights. You will see it everywhere, especially when you are shooting at home or when you are interviewing someone, the lights are actually fluorescent lights. It's very common, okay? But in film, you will see these lights, a redhead lights or an HMI light, okay? This is typically used on filmmaking. Even at this point in time, people Production houses uses this. Exactly. So these lights are actually using the same concept of alternating current. It closes on and off. It's, it's just simply close on and off. See, I would just like to emphasize this. Because here, as we said a while ago, it turns up and down, actually. That, this light, actually, that you can see, it actually turns on and off. But you can notice it because it happens very rapidly in a second. It happens 50 times here in this country that you couldn't recognize that, ah, okay, it's shutting down and turning on, okay? So just a little bit of a history. Actually, this area here, the red ones, are actually using a 50 hertz. Actually, this guy you were asking before, this is actually the answer of this, okay? Here. This is 60 hertz. This all over the red area here in our globe is actually using a 60 hertz power line. While US and Latin America here, Saudi and somewhere Southeast Asia, Philippines, and somewhere in Korea are actually using a 60 hertz. Why this is very important? Because you are always influenced by this, okay? Especially when you are shooting indoor. So. This is UAE here, and we are shooting at this, 50. We are having a frequency, 50 hertz per second. This is very important to recognize when, you, when we go along the way, okay? So I got to give you an example on this because this is, uh, see, I'm using this example not to defame this company, okay? Please forgive me, but... Uh, this is actually as an example for us to be aware of what we are doing, okay? This is an example. This is not to defame the company of this one. I, I, I actually ordered here online. That's why I saw this video, okay? So let me play this video to you. I needed this break. You didn't even start. Why? Do you still want to? Yeah, I am. Yeah, okay. really, because I mean, if maybe by mistake you ordered or. No, I don't Yeah, okay, so you're sure. <laughs> yeah, perfect, sure. perfect. Okay. Here you go. Uh, uh. Guys, have a good day. Thank you so much. So, how many times did you see a flicker? Indoor, what else? How many times? Okay, how many? Okay, see, this is, uh, this is the, where the flicker happens. This part here, you can see. Right? And somewhere here. Okay, here you go. No, I don't Yeah, okay, so you're sure. <laughs> Take a look here. Perfect, perfect. Somewhere here, behind. Somewhere here, uh, okay? Uh, Guys, have a see? good day. Thank you so much. Saw that? Have you seen that? Okay. okay. 
Guys, let me ask you a question. Where do you think this video has been shot? Which camera did uh, this guy use? Phone. Exactly. Phone. OK, guys. I want you to, you have an iPhone, right? I think everyone has an iPhone. Pick your iPhone, OK? Let's have an experiment here. OK? OK. Guys, it was, an slow, it was a slow-mo video, right? Take a look at it. Go to your iPhone. Go here. For you to evaluate, are we really on 50 hertz? Okay, take a go to your settings, go to camera, go to settings, because definitely your video now are set to somewhere else. Okay, but let's just have an experiment here. Okay, go to the slow mo. Okay, of your uh, of your settings. Okay, are you there? <coughs> set it to either. Uh, go here to make it exaggerated, okay? Go to 180 HD at 240 frames per second. Try it. <laughs> okay. J just try it. You will see. How, what do you see? Here. This one here. Slow-mo. Go to slow-mo. Go, go to your camera settings. Go to slow-mo. Okay, and here. OK, exactly. Now, go to your camera. OK, go to your camera now. OK, try to take a shot there. This is on slow-mo. If you take a look, there will be, you will see some flickers on it. Right? Have you guys seen it? There are flickers on it, right? And uh, you've seen it, right? Now you are evaluating something that, OK, it's an irony actually happening. Because we are here on a 50 hertz power line. The, our lights are actually powered by a 60 hertz, a 50 hertz power line. And our camera actually that we're using, especially iPhones, are 60 frames per second. What an irony, right? <laughs> So if you go for slow-mo, you will be wondering why my videos are flickering, especially at home when you're doing slow-mo. That's going to happen. Some, usually, it will happen. OK, ha you've seen it, right? Good, good. Thank you. So here, actually, this is what is happening now, OK? Last week, I was in KSA, OK? And KSA is the? is a 60 hertz region, OK? I'm going to give you an example on this, because uh, in the same way I was uh, talking to the Saudians, uh, and, and they were fascinated about this as well for this kind of example, OK? In, in, my, in my hotel, I tried to record something with these settings, OK? Because if you are new to this region, you, would, you wouldn't realize that, because you will be bringing your own settings when you are a videographer. Without knowing anything, you might be using the same settings that you have been when you were here. But the problem is this one. What, what are you noticing now? Flickering. It's flickering, right? Because my setting was on 50 frames per second on a 50p HD recording. That is happening. Okay, this is very cu crucial because it will ruin the whole video of yours. Sometimes you will not notice it on cam, but when you record something and watch it on a bigger screen, you will notice that, oh my goodness, it was, it was flickering. And sometimes you wouldn't see it on your display in your camera because it's, sometimes it's too small, sometimes it's too bright. Okay, so how did I mitigate this kind of issue? Go ahead. This is in Saudi. Okay. It's actually a standard, okay? It's actually a standard because uh, long ago, as what Mr. Tariq was, the engineers choose to differentiate all these regional uh, settings of their electricity or their power line, okay? And it so happened that US is using a 60 hertz per second. And because 
U.S. has so much influence on in Saudi at that you know way back in our history. So they implemented 60 hertz per second. This is why here, this is U.S. which is using 60 hertz, and this. And actually, we were also colonized by U.S. That's why Philippines is also 60 hertz. It's the influence that actually matters. Okay, so. What did I do? I set my camera here. I was here a while ago, okay? I shot it on 50p at 50 frames per second, okay? So I shot it like this again, using the correct settings. And this is what happened, see? You wouldn't see any flicker anymore, right? So this is how, because most of the uh, video especially for the newbies doesn't care about this they forget they tend to forget that this is very very important and this is the science of it when it comes to recording of the video you need to choose the exact right format of each and every region okay when you do video shooting it, doesn't matter if it's it matters also as what I said Remember when we do the experiment for the iPhone, we choose to have the 240 frames per second? It tends to have a flicker because it's a division of all of the 60 and 50 as well. Okay? So. But the iPhone does not have an option to 25 or 30. That's the irony of it. That's the irony of it. That's what I was saying. The irony here is you have a phone which is globally used and doesn't have the settings of this. I, I don't know, I, I still don't know the reason why. But I'm just highlighting this, I hope iPhone, if they're listening now, <laughs> Apple, <laughs> they can somehow put a 25 frames per second or 50 frames per second of recording, okay? So this is the science of it. I, I, I'm gonna go back again to this, because this is very important. As we said, there is always here, that frame here, this, similar to the refresh rate of the monitors is actually happening with this, okay? Imagine that these yellow blocks here are the representation of this. Each fraction of a second, our power line actually turns on and off, but you won't notice it because it happens rapidly as I was saying a while ago. So this is your frame rate again, 50, so it doesn't match. That's why it creates a flicker, okay? continuously as you record your video, okay? So, again, here we are using a television format here. There are regional formats here happening, NTSC, SECAM, but the most famous here are actually NTSC and PAL, which is U.S. and all over the, the region where it's using PAL, okay? So, the good thing about Nikon is... Uh, you don't need to choose. I will challenge now who are having Canon or Sony. Try to change your format from NTSC to PAL or vice versa. Do you have anyone here who has Canon or Sony? Go to your camera. Do you have it with you? Open your camera. Try to change your format from PAL to NTSC or vice versa. You have to reformat your card either way, or you have to reboot your camera. Try it, you can, uh, because what happens is, I don't know why they have implemented this kind of uh, demarcation, but in Nikon, you don't have to do that. As you continue with, the, you know, checking with your settings, check it out. If you change your settings from NTSC to PAL, or PAL to NTSC, you have to restart your camera or your recording, especially when you already have recorded the materials. When, uh, when I was shooting along with one guy with me, and uh, he was using an A7, a Sony A7 III, and he asked me why my video was flickering. Ah, uh, okay, maybe because you are set to NTSC, I said. So when uh, he take a look at the display and room around, uh, go through the settings, and he saw it was on NTSC. When he shifted from NTSC to PAL, he was asked to reboot 
or reformat the camera. That, a, that, that model of the camera was A7 III. Okay, it's a Sony. So even on now, I have a PXW camera, which is X70. Every time I change, okay, format from NTSC to PAL, you have to reboot or reformat your memory card. I don't know why. Okay? I, I, I hope there already, there's already a firmware upgrade on it to mitigate this issue. But in Nikon, I think they have foreseen this advantage. Because here, you don't have to reboot or restart or uh, whatsoever or reformat your card. You can easily change it here without any question why, whether it's NTSC or PAL. It's very easy, seamlessly. On your camera, you can, uh, on the Nikon, on all Nikon models, you can see this, that you don't need to change from NTSC to PAL. This is very crucial for people who are traveling from one country to another. You are traveling, let's say, to Saudi or to US, to Europe. This setting matters, okay? So frame rates, again, let me just go back because we are already ending this topic. So usually, if you are on this region, on this kind of region, I, I think you have to use this. Usually, at 25 frames per second used in television. But if you want to edit your materials, you have to use this. Okay? If you are distributing your video into a TV station, okay, you can use these settings here just for your guidance. Okay? The same way with uh, NTSC. Okay? It's actually 29.97 frames per second. It's it's not an exact 30 frames, okay? You can use this as well when you are distributing materials to television stations, okay? If you're in Philippines or in US, you have to follow all the science of distribution of uh, contents, okay? Yes, yes, because you're editing... Yeah, because the way you edit your material is actually has to be relevant with the way how you took your videos. When you, when you took your video, okay, when you record, let's say, at 50 frames per second or 60 frames per second, the editing machine also has to be set in accordance with your video recording because it has to match. Sometimes people doesn't realize that sometimes they shoot at 50 frames or 24 frames per second and edit at 60 hertz or 60 frames per second sorry so this there will be a mismatch and sometimes you will realize why my video is jumping and why my video is flickering this is actually a scenario of one of our fellow here that he is doing a time lapse and he is shooting at 24 he intends to sh to record at 24 frames per second and he was saying, my video are actually flickering. And uh, I told him, change it to either record at 25 frames or 50 frames or 60 frames, and your editing settings, configuration has to be the same with what your source is. So that's the key. Okay? So with all of this, guys, please, sometimes when it's too bright outside, use your histogram. I, I never turn this off when I do my shooting. Every time I do go outside, I see to it that all of my shots has to be referred to this. This is very, very important. Sometimes you couldn't see the, the display of your monitor in your camera, and this is where you only rely here, the histogram. When it goes here, this is your white area and this is your black, okay, when this, waveform here goes here on the right side it means that you are overexposed or underexposed if you are on the left side okay so setting summary okay just just wrap this up somehow uh, we had our hang on <clears throat> okay we had our white balance of course just to wrap this up ISO aperture shutter speed frame rate and of course exposure which is very important as well. Let's go to the lighting, okay? 
Lighting in the sense of, uh, of you have to the director of what you are, you are shooting at, okay? Good lighting does matter, actually. Um, uh, as I said a while ago, when, whenever we go to an ocular inspection, we see to it that lights are sufficient in order for us to take shots properly, okay? Shooting outdoor at noon is not recommended. Why? Why do you think it's not recommended? At noon, you will create this raccoon eyes on your subject, especially for, uh, for European, for Arab guys. When you take a shot, they have this, this, have this uh, forehead, which is, uh, which is in the, uh, the way it looks. You know, they, they have deep eyes. So what happens is if you are shooting at noontime, it tends to have a raccoon eyes, which is totally very impossible to correct. Okay, so as much as possible, morning or late afternoon, do the, do your shot. Okay, if you can, if you can stop, you know, if you can, you cannot avoid it. Try to shoot in full shade somehow. Okay, and keep your camera subject at the same lighting condition. Your camera and the subject has to be in the same lighting condition. Okay, if it's dark, add light. Right, open the curtains. Right. Turn on the lights or lamps, okay? Move the subject to a better source of light. I am gonna give you an example in a little while, okay? A DIY lighting kit can be inexpensive, by the way. You can use your mobile phone lights as a DIY. Okay, let me give you an example on this. My team actually got the Global Village uh, project for the, the next six months. And uh, when I was shooting at the first day, um, this VIPs came along and then suddenly had a shot. I was, I was shooting at my C, uh, using my Z6, and uh, and uh, this guy suddenly called me and said, oh, "Take a picture of us." I was expecting this, by the way, and immediately this is unedited, by the way. This is unedited on JPEG format. So if you can take a look at it, I boost this to 6,400 ISO, and uh, see. It's unedited, it's actually made from projector light. And see the quality, it's still really good. Because I know what to do. This situation is actually, they want to take their shot on this side here, on farther left. Because you have to make sure that your light is sufficient, I pulled four of them to a better lighting condition nearby as a, a light post, and then voila, I got a good shot, and it was actually, a, yes, exactly, you have to, and then they were actually saying, come on, it's okay here, come on, take a shot on us, we are in a hurry. No, please, you can move here. So you have to direct your subject. This is very important. You have to communicate properly with your subject. Otherwise, you will end up getting a very bad shot. Okay, this is the second shot. It's the same way. I pulled them to a... You can see the light here. It's actually coming from the light post. But going farther here, see the shadow here? It's almost nothing at all. So you have to, you know, direct. Somehow be resourceful to somehow grab them to a better lighting condition. Okay? So, composition. Okay, let's start with composition. Okay. Uh, Nikon developed a, a, a frame. If you turn on the frame grid of uh, Nikon camera, you will see this square type of uh, frames or grid. Okay? So, but before we continue with this, anyone who knows Fibonacci sequence or golden ratio or divine proportion, photographers definitely know about this. You guys know about this, right? Photographers? Anyone knows about this? Okay. Okay. Let me just continue. Now I think you guys have an idea now, right? This is the golden ratio. This is the Fibonacci spiral. This one here, and even the whole universe is actually based on Fibonacci spiral. Okay. So, why I'm bringing this to you? Why I'm bringing this up to you? Okay. Because 
this is, sorry about the presentation, when it was transferred to this laptop, it got a little bit messy. So this is the frame grid of Nikon. And uh, if you take a look at it, this is the Fibonacci sequence. Most of you guys knows about this, or maybe some of you are not yet familiar with this, but this is usually being used by photographers, by experts who used to do videos and, uh, and photography. Okay, if you combine all these two, it's actually hitting on this part of the grid of Nikon here. Okay, and if you multiply all of this again, it's actually here because you apply all these spirals here, perfectly matching on this part of that uh, somehow composition. Okay. Some people use this rule of third, right? I think uh, you guys know it's rule of thirds, but according to experts, uh, Fibonacci is actually more subtle than the rule of thirds, as they said, okay? so. Nikon have done this really beautifully because they have followed this sequence of framing guidance. You are guided by a, a frame that is actually based on a Fibonacci spiral. Okay? So those shots are actually here. If you can take a look at it, when I was doing the dragon boat uh, uh, video, see the spirals are being uh, taken. So. Uh, you have to nearly a rule of third and a Fibonacci uh, spiral using this kind of concept, this kind of technique. Okay? So here, if you can see, this is the base of where we are standing, they are standing, and see the sides here? It's carefully crafted, actually. It's, uh, you have to do it properly. This is a video, actually. I've taken this from a video. Okay, and this guy here. If you turn this to the other way around, it will fall somewhere here, okay? Because you have to compose your shot properly, okay? So, other types of composition are balance and symmetry. I want to perform it a while ago, but uh, um, I hope the, uh, the camera is already working. Uh, can we connect? Uh, yeah, can, can we do it? So let me give you a, a demo on this. This uh... okay. 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 Oops. Oops. Let me let me uh, change this. Change this. So, guys, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, shot that we are trying to show here is actually uh, the balance or symmetry, okay? If, uh, if you have a subject, can I have one subject here? Can I, is it okay? Can, sir, can I have you as my subject for a while? So, sim simple, very simple composition. If you want to have a balance or symmetry, you take your subject here, immediately take a look at your background, okay? If I take a shot of him here, see the shot here? It's actually a balance and symmetry, right? Why? It's actually referring to your background. That's symmetry of two poles or two lines down behind him. It's actually a balance and symmetry. See, something like that. See? Okay. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. The other, the other one is actually a depth of field. Depth of field also is very important when you are composing something. So when you have a... Can I have another... Can I have another... Sir, can I get you as my subject, please? So depth of field is... Uh, is uh, it's like... If you can, uh, here, sir, on this side, please. Mm -hmm. This side, okay, okay, please. Okay, please. 
So depth of field is when you are triggering your subject right at the very focal point of your camera. So here on this side here, okay, see how the blurriness of the, see how the blurriness of the camera? It's actually depth of field. Usually, take a look at it, okay? See the blurriness of, uh, of the subject? Usually, it's being used when there are lights behind him. The problem is we don't have uh, lights that turns into bouquet. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That turns into bouquet, that's a problem. So, but when you have lights, light bulbs, and a lot of things, you can simply create this kind of shots, okay? Okay, let me continue with the, okay. So, there's another one. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. Keep. Okay, so, so uh, there's another one, which is the deep space composition, okay? If you have, uh, let's say, two guys, uh, stand, sir, can I, can I, sir, can I ha have you as my, yes, please. If you have two guys out here, sir, please move backward a little bit. And uh, he is somewhere here, okay? Let me continue with the shots here, okay? A deep space shot is actually looking like this, okay? So this is the shot here. The focus that was, is with him. So this is a deep space composition, okay? So your subject is actually far away from the person standing in front of him. It's like there's a drama if you are like shooting a drama or some sort of they are, I don't know, fighting and then trying to say something for, against each other. These shots are actually very useful for this kind of uh, drama. Okay, please take a seat, sir. Thank you very much. So there's a lot more that I want to do, like the, uh, the leading uh, lines, okay? Uh, can we put this back, please? But the point is we don't have, uh, we, we are somehow less, uh, we don't have that resources here. That's why uh, I couldn't perform the other subjects here. So the leading lines, okay? I level the same way as what I have done a while ago, okay? Okay, those are the other shots here. Sorry, let me put it back for you to take a shot. Okay, those are the actually other compositions apart from the rule of thirds or the other one, which is a Fibonacci spiral. Okay, so guys, you can take a shot of it. So, angles and movements. Uh, okay, you can take a shot, please. Sorry, we have to entertain the ladies here, okay, okay. Angles and movements, okay. Movements and angles are very important when you do your shots, okay, because it gives the drama, it gives the how the way you want to imply your, your video, okay. How do you, do you want to deliver the message? This is very important, okay. Warm eye, warms eye, okay. This is a low angle shot, okay. It's taken like, uh, like the camera is at the very lowest angle, okay? Do your camera shots like this. Your camera position would be very, very low, okay? And uh, the medium warm eye, of course, is a little bit higher, okay? And eye level, which is when you are shooting the camera, level would be the same with the eye level of your subject, okay? Bird's eye, somehow a higher level of shot, okay? And over the shoulder, okay? I want to perform it, but we have less, uh, uh, okay. And then the Dutch angle. Dutch angle is something like when you take a shot like uh, a little bit angled when, uh, I want to show it actually, but uh, Okay. 
Just for, your, for us to have a realization on it, Dutch angle is actually something like this. So when your subject is tilt, a little bit tilted on a different angle, it's actually a Dutch angle. Sometimes do it this way. You can see this on a different movies, actually. And it's called Dutch angle. OK? So there, there are other shots here. Okay, camera movement. Okay, we used to do zooming. Of course, uh, people, uh, you guys know about this already. And uh, panning, of course. Panning from left to right, right to left. Tilt. Is there any pan down and pan up? No, right? Only tilt. Tilt down and tilt up. So, Dolly, when your camera movement moves from, uh, from, uh, frontal and move forward that's what you call dolly shot okay pedestal pedestal anyone knows about pedestal shot no pedestal shot is actually from either down to up and it's better shot when you have a foreground okay or up to down so parallax what is parallax this is very, very uh, common now, especially when, uh, when, uh, when you're using a glider or a gimbal. No, no, that is a vertigo shot. Okay, the parallax is actually when your subject is in the center and you move your camera around it. That is a parallax shot. So this terminology is used in, in, uh, in professional uh, uh, cinematography, in videography. When your director says, I want the parallax shot, you should know how to do it. <laughs> you should know how to do it, okay? Especially during live, okay? So, POV. Who knows point of view shot? It's simulating. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Exactly. Okay. It's actually simulating your audience visual experience. Okay, when, when let's say someone uh, fell down and, you know, that camera follows the same way it falls down. Okay, that is the POV shot. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. We were having a chit chat in Rove Hotel and I was bringing my, I was having my Z6 and suddenly we just thought about, let's, you know, kind of take a shot. Without using any gimbal or anything, I've just used the IBIS of the Z6 or internal body stabilization. I came up with this, okay, with my colleagues. That's a pedestal shot. That's a parallax shot. Shot. Still a parallax shot. Always end up your video with a smile. That was just a, it was a, uh, what we call it, uh, that shot. How do you call it? You guys, the, the ending shot? Vortex shot, yes. That is a vortex shot. It's actually being uh, upgraded now. Some of the crane, some of the, like a D DJI crane and the rest of the guys who makes, uh, uh, you know, these gliders. Actually, they have made already an upgrade to support this kind of shot. But I just 
did it by my hand using the internal body stabilization of Nikon. There's no any other gadgets there used, okay? So, guys, I will be fast on this because uh, for your information, Nikon has been in the broadcast for several uh, months now. Um, we have been introdu uh, we've introduced this camera, especially the Z series, uh, to TV stations. But we we before we move forward on this, uh, anyone have been into a TV station before? A TV station, yes, a TV station. Ah, okay, that's good, sir. That's good. Okay, so a TV station is a complex set of uh, of infrastructure. Okay, you can find uh, this camera where you house the studio. Okay, this is the field production where shooters, ENG shooters, come comes back to the station and give their materials. Okay, and you can have your graphics production. You can have your graphics. Those stickers that you can see on TV, it's actually created on this area of the station. And this is the production switcher, okay? This is the control where you can choose your inputs, your source and destinations, okay? This is the editing machines, okay? And uh, this, is, this is the part where you have to transmit all your signals. If you want to have your video or broadcasted uh, uh, signal to YouTube or social media, you guys can have this. And of course, the little receiver here as a satellite receive or a downlink. Usually, typically, you can see this on a broadcast TV station. Okay. Why am I highlighting this to you? Because uh, if you are creating a system or a camera that is being used on a TV station, you are heavily influenced by, by the way you have to interconnect your system. Your camera, your VTRs, and the rest of the equipment has to be in an infrastructure. You have to define it. Most of the TV stations are actually using SDI, or Serial Digital Interface. This is heavily used in most of the TV stations, especially nowadays. Okay, they are using this as well, Triax. Okay, this is a connection between camera and uh, OB van or a studio. Okay, and multi-core camera cables. Okay, these are similar to each other but in a different way of doing things. But it's connected to a camera. Okay, so Triax and multi-core is actually for long distance cabling. Actually, this can go for hundreds of meters, and it doesn't uh, go lose any information. Okay, same as to the multi-core. Okay, this is actually heavily used on ENG vans, OB vans, where the CCU here, the camera control unit, controls the camera settings. All the cameraman has to do here is to take the shot and focusing. That's it, because the color balancing. The ISO or the gain is actually controlled by this guy here inside the OB van. Okay? So a camera is typically looks like this. This is the Triax connectivity here. I've taken this shot when we were in exposure 2019 in Sharjah. So just to give an example to the rest of the guys who were there at that time. Okay? See the complexity of the camera. It's like, uh, I can see it. It's, it's like you are uh, having this beast of a camera. But actually, in a little while, I'm going to give you something else on this. Okay? And this is the cabling. It can go hundreds of meters. Okay? So SDI, actually, and Triax, okay, these are the cables. These are the infrastructures that are being used in the TV stations. Okay? When... Uh, when uh, 3G SDI has been introduced in 2006. This is the supported video, okay, 1080p60, okay, and later on, it, they developed something to support 4K in broadcast, okay, and since then, four years from now, haven't developed anything 
more. Right? Since then, if you see, this has been somehow slowed down for a bit because the technology is very expensive. This technology, when you use on broadcast platform, broadcast TV station, it's very, very expensive. You have to, especially for the cameras that you use, it's very expensive. Okay? So, these are the limitations of this kind of equipment. When, when you are a prosumer, for us, if we want to buy this kind of uh, equipment, it's very hard for us to find because it's hard to find, as we say. Okay? And you can buy them off, sh off the shelf. You have to go to a proper distributor of these kinds of cameras because these are so expensive. It costs a fortune. Okay? Okay, and these are really, really expensive. Okay, what is the alternative? Alternative is what? <laughs> okay, apart from that, okay. What else? As an infrastructure, okay. As an infrastructure, actually, the ideal solution for us, for prosumer, is actually using an SD HDMI solution. Okay, and there were actually, there, were, there, there was a... a an article on the web that's saying that video over HDMI has proven for more than a decade and it has a place in professional and broadcast TV infrastructure and it's used continuously to grow. Do you think this will replace SDI, guys? Okay, it could be. It, it depends actually on your usability. It can replace, depends on your usability. Or maybe not. But let me give you another example on this, okay? Let me just continue with this. As of the moment, HDMI 2 already supports 4K. And recently, HDMI 2.1, if you know about this, has been released already. This is the, it supports actually 8K of video. Imagine 8K. So. Because HDMI solution is actually flexible for us. It's prosumer solution. So, and it carries a 48 gigabits per second. It's so huge, right? It's still having this information, supports this, the resolution of 10K, imagine. 10K, it hasn't been out actually for, for now. But it's already actually anticipating this resolution. Okay, the dynamic range still there, supported, and ultra high speed, of course. So if you compare SDI here on this side and HDMI, see the difference. The maximum SDI capacity is only 12 gig gigabits per second, while HDMI 2.1 is four times of it. So this is a very good alternative solution now for us prosumer if you want to have that kind of look and quality of your video this is the alternative solution that we can have and it's affordable by the way i'm not saying i'm not marketing the hdmi solution but you guys can definitely justify this it's easier to find okay unlike the sdi side it's only for broadcast somehow and uh, the next level of broadcasting and prosumer use okay but there are big differences on this because an HDMI can only go for a maximum of 15 meters maximum. More than that, your quality of your video could be compromised. Unlike SDI, you could go 300 meters or 1,000 feet without losing your video or any information in your video. So comparatively, SDI is for actual mission critical. You want to have that thing. You want to have that coverage which is really highly paid. You use this kind of solution, though it is expensive. Okay? While HDMI is less expensive, but it can still have your broadcast quality that can be found out. Okay? You can still find this broadcast quality in HDMI. Okay. So We've actually combined all of this. During the exposure, 
we've combined all this technology because since we can only run 15 meters of cable, so that's the maximum length we can have. So we've combined all of this, SDI and HDMI, and a solution. And the result is actually a pro video solution from Nikon. So as of the moment, two TV stations are now using C6 as their camera for their broadcasting. Okay. If you can see this, this is from NTV. And this is the control booth. And the camera, the Z6, is actually here. So we've already introduced this to TV stations. And we are having a good influence now when it comes to using Z6 as their camera compared to the, like, the big beast that you have to drive on as a cameraman. Now people, are, people in the broadcast market are somehow realizing that, hey, I can use this kind of cameras as a solution, as an alternative solution, right? And it actually improves your CapEx. So let me show you this, why, why this camera, why Z6 is a best contender for this kind of environment. Let me just show you this video. This is why uh, Nikon uh, Z series are actually uh, the best contender for this level of market now. And uh, so, just to summarize the features which we have uh, 4K focus picking, of course, it's now available. This can be found actually in several broadcast uh, cameras. Okay? And, uh, Zebra stripes, as Mr. Tarek discussed a while ago. Uh, N-Lug, of course, time code recording, and 10-bit uh, HDMI output. The 12-bit HDMI output is actually coming soon, maybe in the next coming days. Uh, Nikon has already announced the 12-bit support. Uh, and uh, this is very phenomenal because most of the DSLR mirrorless cameras, which has the same level of uh, qualification, actually doesn't have 10K for now. I will explain it to you in a little while. 
And now, 12 bit is coming. It's a huge thing for us, by the way. I'll explain it to you in a little while, by the way. So during the exposure, we've set this up. I've actually designed a system which could uh, somehow show to simulate the, uh, the way how broadcasters do their newscasting. But we, I have did it in a different way somehow. There's a tweaking on it. We've actually show all the interconnections for people to see it, how this camera has been set up. Here you can see the cables running around from the other side. So it's messy, but the intention here is to show the people that it can be done. You guys can do it as well. OK? So this is the quality of the video. Let me have a closer look on it, see? You can see this green screen actually behind this is actually a digital studio. And we're trying to, to send a message to everyone uh, during that time that this camera, this system can actually almost go beyond the capability of all those TV broadcast cameras, OK? If you were that this is just taken from a, a camera, actually from my iPhone, but see, see the quality. It's superb, especially when you see it on a real TV. So what we've done actually is here we've used a production switcher, okay, a HoloLand, a wireless camera, which we have used a while ago. This is the, this is a real setup. This is a real broadcast setup. You can, you can find this solution anywhere, especially on TV stations. But this is a very minimalistic uh, 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 setup. OK, by just changing this part here, you can actually go for a live telecast. Change this, this output, because we tried to show the program out to a different screen. By just changing this, you can actually go for a social media live, or Facebook live, or YouTube live, or a satellite feed. OK? I'm going to show you something, guys, uh, because the same camera has been used in the Filipino community, there is actually a so-called global Filipino. We are featuring uh, successful Filipinos in the UAE, having some interview. And uh, my colleagues couldn't believe that this was taken from a Z6 camera. I'm going to this video just for you to see, guys, how, how is the quality. One yes. of the happiest years. Oh, yes, indeed, mm -hmm. indeed. Mm -hmm. But when I was diagnosed See, with breast cancer. You wouldn't believe that this is taken from a mirrorless one. DSLR camera live. And the oncologist told me. This is a live streaming over Facebook. So this is already downgraded. This is not edited, by the way. No. For me, it's who am See? I to question. It is live streaming. You can still see this on this Facebook here. You can still find this video. The point here is we are using this in a broadcast quality streaming. And no one can believe, no one couldn't believe that this is actually came from a Z6 signal. This is an HDMI 10-bit output. See the quality. This is already downgraded. But if you take a look at it on Facebook Live, you can see the quality. It's totally far from any other. Okay. Let me show you, because my colleagues couldn't believe that this is coming from a Z6 camera, so I've recorded something for them. See the video? Breast cancer does not necessarily mean it came from a Z6, just to prove them that this is a Z6 camera. Okay. So, in the same way, we've actually doing this. This camera has been heavily used now, especially on my team. I've been using this for quite some time, especially on live shows uh, over Facebook Live. Uh, allow me to play this video to you. Somehow this will entertain you as well. See the quality of the video. It's live streaming. You couldn't believe that this is a live stream. Right? It's actually the 10 bit HDMI output is there. That's what I'm saying. It can replace the, HD, uh, the SDI, the quality of the SDI, through the HDMI output. 
see the flickers? Behind us, supposedly, there will be flickers. But these are huge screens. And now you know how to resolve it, right? When my cameraman first turned on these cameras, it was so flickering. And we mitigated it the way how I explained it to you while So, we've already introduced uh, wireless connections here. So the next shot here, this shot is at the camera. So we've... Uh, how do we do that? We've used this kind of tool here, the wireless. We've introduced the same technology into the setup and one had the shot because normally it will be cable there will be uh, in uh, in big camera setups there will be a guy who will be holding the cables for you for the cameraman okay so the point here is to show how z6 is actually heavily used now in in this kind of setup and uh, this was actually, because no one couldn't believe, my colleagues couldn't believe that I've been using Z6, so my cameraman actually take a shot of it. This one, it was during before the live. And uh, I actually, I was here doing the blocking because I do the direction as well. I, I, I direct uh, shows as well. So the same two shows, I do the directing of this, uh, of this live shows. Okay? So, shooting as a team. Okay, it's very important that uh, you have to synchronize with all of the rest of the team, especially during live coverage. Okay, that's why um, you have to identify camera types. Whether it is recording or on a live uh, uh, platform, you have to identify the cameras. Okay, especially what kind of model is it? Is it a, a low light camera? Does it does it, is it good on low light or is that good on low light? So you have to identify your cameras here. Okay, frame rate settings. If you are shooting as a team, make sure that your frame rate are the same. Whether it's on live or has to be edited in the future, it has to be on the same frame rate. What we have explained a while ago. Lens capability. This is very important because when you are shooting as a team, you have to allocate your lenses according to your shots. You have to allocate one guy. If the he is using, one guy is using a 7200 lens, then ask him to take a shot only for tight shots. Okay? If there is a guy who is using a 2470 lens, then ask him to shoot for a wider shot. Let's say four shots, group shots. Because efficiency matters here. Because when you allocate shots, they know what to do. When there is a redundancy of shots, it's a waste of time for other cameraman that has shot the same shot as what this other guy had. Right? If you had two shots similar to each other, the editor will only choose either one of the shots. Right? So it's a waste of time for the other cameraman. So planning is very important. Remember a while ago I was telling you conceptualization and planning is very important. It's actually here. The lens capability is very important because you have to allocate those shots in each and every cameraman that you have. If I have four cameramen, I have to make sure that he is taking only the shots, particular shots for each one. Okay? Shots assignments, as we said, if uh, that guy, if your guy is recording or doing a live shot for only the dolly shots a while ago, it's for the wireless shot, he has to stick on that shot each and every now and then. Especially on live, you have to block all of the shots. Okay? When you say shot one, most of us doesn't know, we, could, we would no longer say, okay, you have to run from here, from left to the other side, from right to the other side. When I say shot one, as a director, the cameraman knows what to do. Okay? He has to do that shot one because it's already blocked. Okay? When I say shot two, he knows what to do. It has either a pedestal shot from down below, up. Okay? Shot three, it's something else. Go to the back or do a parallax shot. Something like that. So 
by just doing this, it becomes efficient. Your time becomes efficient because you don't have to shout over the intercom and say, I did the shot, I, I want the chat. No need for that, okay? Physique. Not all cameramen has the same height. Some are actually not endowed with the height. Some are actually small. You have to allocate them on a strategic or a vantage point of uh, a view when they are shooting. Make sure that if there is a crowd, usually we do shots during Jitex, during Kabsat, and when His Highness comes over to the crowd, all the crowd really go crazy. And then, you know, if you have a cameraman who is small, and then uh, what's the point? Choose someone who is the biggest among the team and uh, the tallest among the team, and then allocate that shot to that particular guy. You ju just cannot just say, okay, I want you guys to shoot whatever you want to shoot. You have to direct all your cameramen properly to have a more successful shoot, okay? So allow me to play this one here. Um, I was commissioned to do some video here. Uh, this, uh, this actually you can find it still in their IG, okay? This was shot as a team. Triple five, double eight. Hatta rakam al kubba mumayyaz. The winner is Mrs. Sultana bin Haydar. Assalamu alaikum. I am Sultana Isa bin Haydar from the Emirates of Dubai. I worked from Sahara for 200 dirhams. ودخلت السحب، اتفاجأت ان اتصلوا فيني اني ربحت سيارة بي ام دبليو وانا وايد مستانسة. So what have you noticed on the sound and the video? It was syncing with the beat, right? It's matching because this creates a that entertainment that I was talking about, when you watch a video, it, the, the intention here is to immerse your audience and to engage them along the way. So that video, when, uh, it, when it was seen by Sahara, they said, okay, let's publish it on IG. You can still find it on IG, by the way. So the point here is the bottom line always is to entertain your viewers, to make sure that this are actually accepted by your client. In this case, it's actually this guy is here, okay? So there are deadly sins, of course, in uh, shooting. You cannot just go out and shoot your video. There are also restrictions, by the way. So headhunting. Don't put your subject, never put your subject always in the middle of your frame because it ruins the, the composition. Placing every subject in the center of the frame is an offense, actually. You will lose your job tomorrow if you do that. <laughs> when you are assigned to take headshots, don't put your shots in the middle, all in the middle of uh, your frame. It's actually a deadly sin. Directors knows this, and you guys has to know this as well. If you want to go for this kind of platform, if you want guys to go for a videography, make this as a profession somehow or, or a professional hobby, as I say, you have to take note of this, okay? Motor zooming, okay? Some cameras have zoomers, okay? Motorized zoom. And uh, DSLR cameras can also be attached with this kind of mechanism. And if you overuse this kind of functionality, you ruin the shot. There are several issues that have been raised on this kind of, of use of motor zooming, okay? Routing, okay. Staying in one spot instead of looking for an interesting angle. Okay, I have one cameraman before who were, he was so, he was so shy 
that he has to stay on the very edge of the room and then take the shot. I'll just use my zoomer and then that's it, take a shot. The thing is, if you do this, the creativity of your shot will be ruined. Because when it goes back to the editor, and you own, it's, it's very obvious that you are not moving, you are not suggesting shots, and this is a deadly sin. Don't be shy. When you are out there in the open and you are in an event, you are shooting something, seize the moment, seize that opportunity, take that shot. It's okay. You have the camera on with you. Okay? So, fire hosing. This is another deadly sin. Because fire hosing is a shot that pans from left to right, and then again, it's like you are trying to kill a fire. This is a very deadly sin. So much that uh, uh, some cameramen could, could lose their job here. Okay? So, upstanding. Shooting everything on an eye level. See, remember a while ago, take that shot of the warm shot. At least suggest something. You cannot just bring a tripod and then do like this, and then take a shot. It, it should not be like that. At least adjust your tripod, adjust your shots. It cannot always be an eye level shot. Okay, snap shooting. Don't hesitate to record, okay? Especially when you are in a news environment. I, I, I grew up in a very intense, heavy news environment. And we are not allowed to record that snap shooting. At least if you trigger your shutter or that button of recording, try to make sure that you are capturing all those scenarios that's happening. Okay. Don't snap shoot. Like trigger and then after three seconds or four seconds, I will stop and then see, especially on documentaries, this is a deadly sin. Okay? So, backlighting. Backlighting is the habit of, uh, I think, some of the bloggers, I should say, and uh, some of the guys who still doesn't know the environment of where they are shooting. Because if you put your subject in front of a very bright source of light, and then you are stand some, something like the light is behind you, or a silhouette, then it is actually a deadly sin. Okay? So, any other questions? Okay, let's move forward, okay? This is the way how Nikon has uh, introduced their 4K 10-bit HDMI output, okay? And by the way, 12-bit is coming out soon. It might be the next week and this coming uh, days, by the way. So, let me show you this, this very important video. This is an explanatory video on how we can use NLAG 4K capability of Nikon ZZ, okay? Aurora is special is how flexible it is and the way it compresses video. Most of the small, large sensor cameras that we shoot on today use codecs like XAVC or H.264. These codecs are okay for retaining a decent amount of information and keeping file sizes small. The problem with these codecs is editing them. When you play back or edit these codecs, your computer has to work a lot harder to decompress the video. So in short, codecs like H.264 have high compression which is good for small cameras and file sizes, but bad for editing and retaining the most information possible. And this is where ProRes steps in. ProRes creates a much larger file than H.264, but it's much easier on your system. This is why many shooters and editors convert or transcode their H.264 files to ProRes before editing. Unfortunately, most cameras can't record video directly to ProRes internally, but this is possible with external recorders such as those found in the Atomos lineup of products. So the ProRes in ProRes RAW tells us that file sizes will be manageable and playback will be good when we sit down to edit our videos. So let me play another video, this, the second part of it. This, ProRes the, special is how flexible it is. There is a continuation the way of it. Okay, this is the, the continuation. For compression, ProRes RAW can be captured in two forms. 
ProRes RAW and ProRes RAW HQ. I tested both of these options for file size comparisons and found the following. When shooting Cinema 4K DCI at 24 frames per second, a 10 second clip in ProRes RAW HQ created a 1.36 gig file. ProRes RAW, not the HQ variety on the other hand, created a 1.17 gigabyte file. Those might sound like huge files if you're new to RAW, but compared to Cinema DNG, those are actually pretty small. Using the same resolution and frame rate, a 10 second Cinema DNG file is a whopping 3.26 gigs, which scaled over time is a huge amount of data, obviously. The size of your file will depend on what you're filming, believe it or not. If you're shooting a heavily over or underexposed image, ProRes RAW will create a larger file with more flexibility to correct in post and correctly expose shots will result in a smaller file size. You can read and see more of this information in Apple's white paper on ProRes RAW. And to quote that document, ProRes RAW is designed to maintain constant quality and pristine image fidelity for all frames. As a result, images with greater detail or sensor noise are encoded at higher data rates and produce larger file sizes. And to learn more about ProRes RAW compression, you can read Apple's official white paper via the link in the description for more information. But the point here is ProRes is very efficient. If it doesn't need to capture a ton of information, it won't. And you'll see those storage savings when you look at your files. So to recap part one of the series on ProRes RAW, this new format allows us to shoot RAW video without the traditional headaches associated with shooting RAW. With ProRes RAW, we can shoot and edit RAW video on newer and older computers without stuttering or giant file sizes. This is a massive shift in our industry, and I, for one, am super stoked to start shooting and using ProRes RAW more. So, so ProRes recording is actually high. It's because it records different levels of ISOs. That's why in the example here, you saw uh, an overexposed video, right? But internally, ProRes actually records different levels of ISO. Those ISOs during the post can actually trigger and select that behind that ProRes recording, and you can choose. That's why even if it is overexposed, you can still get that level of normal quality of your video, which is recorded for the ProRes. Okay, so for compression, ProRes RAW that. can be captured in two forms, ProRes RAW and ProRes RAW H. So here, as we said, most of the competitor of Nikon actually has only this information here. This is very important because uh, you have to understand the color science of each and every camera that you are using. Most of the cameras here, especially on DSLRs, are actually having this color samples, which is 16,777,000. This is the 8-bit color samples of our normal DSLR cameras. Nikon, on the other hand, has released this already on the Z series, which is far away from the 8-bit. It's like a comparison of you have a 16 dirhams and you have a 1,000 dirhams. Okay? That's the difference. Okay? This is a huge difference between the other DSLR competitors of, uh, of Nikon. And soon, 12-bit is coming out from Nikon. And it's actually 68 billion color sample. Imagine that. It's a huge, no, no one have developed this kind of technology before in a DSLR camera. This is huge. This will be coming out soon, by the way, from Nikon Z series. And you have to see the beauty of this. Imagine 68 billion color samples. This is way beyond the normal 8-bit of the normal DSLR. It will be a firmware upgrade. It's, it's as simple as uh, plug your computer, uh, the, I mean your Z6 into the computer and let the upgrade come in. That's it, it's as simple as that. Okay, 
So, any question on this? Okay, go ahead. Okay, actually, uh, of course, uh, on uh, maybe because, uh, have you been uh, doing uh, videography or photography? photography yeah. Yes, because uh, see, there are, what, there are people who are what, who, what we call trained eyes on videos. When you do, uh, uh, as you go along with doing videos, you are actually training your eyes. You tend to, uh, to, Train your eyes in a way that you will notice all those kinds of quality. So if, if you haven't been seen uh, doing this or have you been doing this for quite some time, then you will be able to notice that, okay, 10-bit uh, is better than 8-bit, okay? Let me give you an example. I have a production switcher at home, actually, because I've been doing live shows, uh, live shows uh, every now and then. Um, and what I've actually done is, I have a 1DX Mark II Canon, okay? It's a, it's a highest DSLR lineup of, uh, of Canon. So I place this, it has a, an 8-bit output, okay? I place it into a production switcher along with the Z6 because I was trying to compare all these outputs here. And then you would easily recognize which one is somehow low quality and high quality. Imagine this difference of 16 dirham and 1,000 dirhams. I'm, I'm relating this comparison here. Or 16 million or a 1 billion. You will immediately see. Of course, you might not see it. It's because you are not comparing videos from one quality to another. But if you compare it side by side, especially you put it on a production switcher, you will see the difference. Okay. Of course, here on a presentation here, especially it is projected from, a, from an LED projector, of course, that quality might be less noticeable. Okay? So, any, anyone, any question? More questions, please. Sorry? Okay, uh, lenses actually, for now, I am using in, in my shoots, especially during live coverage, I use the trilogy of lens. I, th I think you guys know that. Uh, our lady here is nodding. Means he knows, uh, she knows about, uh, about the, uh, the trilogy lens. So the trilogy lens is actually, now I'm using a, a 1430, a 2470, and a 7200 lenses from Nikon. It, it's, these are very useful when you do videography. This is very important. Not that uh, uh, I was offered before to use 50 mm, of course, but the thing is, you don't, you cannot adjust your, your, your subject. You have to move back if you have a 50 mm. If you have a prime lens, of course, it shoots really well, but efficiency-wise, I choose the Trinity lenses, by the way. So this is very efficient, especially when you're allocating shots. When you have three cameramen, it can easily do the shots that you want, okay? So, any, anything else? Go ahead, please, sir. Yes, normally I, uh, I recommend, especially during interviews, the interview which I have shown you, uh, it's a combination actually. It depends on your, how, how you want your, your shots to be done. Okay, sometimes I use uh, autofocus, sometimes I don't. Because uh, if, uh, if my subject is moving only from here, left to right, and my camera is in the middle, why would I use an autofocus? I simply measure my focal length because anyway, my subject is not moving back and forth. So I prefer to use a manual focus. If your subject are moving just side to side, I would suggest to use a manual focus. If your subject, this is where the Nikon is good at, by the way, because if your subject is moving forward and backward, 
that's the autofocus that comes in. Okay? It can easily do the autofocusing tracking. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Please, go ahead. Okay. Okay. See, it's actually uh, it's it's not that the computer cannot take it. Uh, by the way, it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a misconception. By the way, I should say, because it doesn't mean that if you have this amount of color samples, it doesn't mean that your computer couldn't uh, couldn't take it. This is the information. That's why it says here possible colors. If you put RGB only on that video, then you can complete all the 60, 68 billion color samples. But because it's a combination of colors, it doesn't necessarily reach 68 billion of colors. It is actually a progressive type of, it's a variable. It's a variable combination of colors. It doesn't say that you have 68 billion of colors. It means that you will only get you will always get 68 billion. That's why it says here, possible colors. So going back to your question, when you say computer cannot process, no, it's not. Uh, it's, it's not correct, by the way. What I'm saying is this is a misconception because there are tools now that can support all of this requirement, especially when you say 12-bit. Because there are actually 24-bit. There are 68-bit of 64-bit uh, uh, of uh, color samples. Da Vinci is actually using this. The color sampling that is used by Da Vinci is actually 60, 64. So we don't have, we don't 64 have bit. Our, our if, if you are using an editing machine, you don't need to. Why would you? Because, see, it, it is the application that supports. Let's say Adobe Premiere. It's the Adobe Premiere that supports the editing of this, right? It's not the computer itself. It is the application. If your application can handle this kind or this software can handle this amount of data, it is good. It's not about, of course, it has to correspond with your hardware because applications runs on a good hardware, but especially on editing machines, you have to have a stable, solid platform for hardware. Yes. I'm going to tell you from my experience. I have two screens. Mm. In one of the screen, the, the picture looks so bad, but in the other screen, I can feel like, okay. You have to change okay. your screen. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so the, the, so the, the one is old, one ah. is new. So on the first screen, it's looking a bit reddish. The ah. color is more red. The, the second one is fantastic, looking like natural. So that's because the first screen does not support that big number of colors that is in the picture. Okay. So maybe we may be, we may be, we may face the same problem in this technology when it's coming uh, to the surface. Our skin cannot uh, cannot support that. It, it is actually uh, see w when you say a screen. Actually, of course there are limitations of the screen. I, I we cannot deny that because it's a technology. When uh, when uh, application uh, upgrades, somehow the uh, the hardware also needs to be upgraded. Like, uh, like, for example, there are applications to support 4K before, right? There were TVs before that cannot support 4Ks, right? They were only LEDs. Of course, this has to be adjusted as well. We cannot deny that fact. I cannot, I cannot challenge that fact because, see, that technology, this technology is inevitable. It will come. So this is actually a challenge for uh, OEM uh, creators, hardware creators, to somehow go along with, the, with all this technology that's coming up. Okay? So your screen, of course, it has a limitation. It's a technological limitation. Yes. Yes. Because your display doesn't support anymore. It, ha it is limited. It is a limited uh, technology already. Okay? Anything else? Oh, okay. So uh, that concludes the uh, the uh, the uh, the somehow this activity.
And uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for today. Stay tuned. Tomorrow we have more to know about videography. We have also a complete part about uh, Adobe Premiere uh, and the certificates for sure. Good night. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. We are making 60. That Nikon will develop a camera Z model for next year, but then it will be 16. They are, you know what, I was about to explain.